Do you think you found the skeleton? skeleton? How would you tell how would you, you first, first, first? How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we're embarking on a new journey with a new creationist, or at least he's new to me. The man of the hour is one Doug Batchelor, who runs Amazing Facts, a Seventh-day Adventist apologetics ministry that, as we'll see, has a definition of fact that is, shall we say, idiosyncratic. Also, as a side note, do creationists know that they're allowed to use noise reduction in their videos? It shouldn't be my job to make them sound good. But since they're going on my channel, I might as well make them bearable to listen to. Also, for some reason, Doug seems to be really fond of the pregnant pause, and it occasionally gets obnoxious. As a result, there may be some jump cuts here and there, and they are just to edit down his crazy pauses. If I skip anything else besides preaching or prayer, I'll let you know what it was and why I skipped it. Oh well, let's hear from Doug. I'm going to be talking with you about the subject of creation, evolution, and logic. Fascinating. Uh, and the reason for that title is because you can't be secure in life if you don't know something about three things. Where you've come from. The Central North American Desert in the Jurassic period. What you're doing here. Exposing anti-evolution pseudoscience. And where you're going. Currently, I'm thinking about going to bed. These are foundational truths. Uh, they're questions. If this guy can't even tell the difference between a truth claim and a question, we're in for some trouble. That uh, really help in life, to have some knowledge of where you've come from, what you're doing here, and where you're going. Well, I think I've got that covered, so that's a relief. Had an interesting phone call at the office this week. Um, uh, an 87-year-old man called, and I'm not even sure I didn't ask Bonnie, did he see the programs or something? Is that how he found out about us? Anyway, somehow he found out about us, saw the name Bachelor, called Amazing Facts. Uh, turns out he grew up with my father, and he's a relative. He's a cousin. Finding long-lost cousins is cool and all, but like... We get into a point soon? And um, he just began to tell me all kinds of things about my family, and I, I called him back, and I plugged him in with other members of the family. to tell them stories that don't go anywhere. Like the time I caught the ferry over to Shelbyville, I needed a new heel for my shoe. So I decided to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. So I tied an onion to my belt. Which was the style at the time. No, I've never to seen. Him. I sent him some pictures, and he was so excited. He's 87 years old, since so clear as he could be. And um, I thought, why? Why was that so precious to me? How does that change my life? By giving context to the life of someone who was or is very important to you. All of us want to better understand something about our our roots, where we've come from, because it gives you direction. It gives you purpose. It gives you an origin. And we're living in a world today where a lot of people believe that there is no purpose to life, that we have come from nothing and we are going nowhere. Oh, we're just setting up an argument from consequences. Got it. Well, let's hear it out, then point out why it's stupid for multiple reasons. Isn't that really what evolution teaches? No, it teaches that populations of biological organisms change the allele frequencies of their genomes over time and can lose or gain genes and that this results in changes in the phenotype and genotypes of those organisms through time as a result of mutation, natural selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, and epigenetics. It also teaches that over time, a population can diverge into new populations, which can become new species, and that ultimately, all species on Earth came about through these processes, plus a few more I left out for the sake of brevity. It has nothing to say about how you should live your life, what the good is, or whether turkey or ham is the better sandwich meat. If there is no God, of course, that's atheism and evolution. Nope, it's just atheism. Evolution has nothing to say about if a God exists or not. You can be a theist who accepts evolution, like most theists, or you can be an atheist who rejects it, like Fred Hoyle. If there is no God, and things all happen totally by accident... Why do creationists pretend that everything about the natural world would be probabilistic without God? Much of physics is quite mechanistic. Oh well. Then there is no purpose to life, and then you die and you go nowhere. Purpose is something that you give yourself. Even if there is a God happy to provide you a purpose, you still have to choose to make that your purpose. Sure, without a God, one possibility for an easy purpose to choose is gone, but your requirement to choose a purpose remains. As for an afterlife, that also does not depend on there being a God. Ghosts could be real and God not. Indeed, much of Buddhist thought is non-theistic, but they also believe that the self can continue after death through reincarnation. 
We've come from nothing and we're going nowhere and life has no purpose. Even if that were true, it's an argument from consequences. Don't believe in climate change. That would mean that maybe there would need to be policy changes and long-term changes in your lifestyle. Don't believe in cancer. Then you might have to worry about getting it. That does not follow. If life has no meaning for you without a god and evolution being false, which are separate propositions, mind you, then that doesn't make a god exist or evolution not exist. And so understanding this subject means everything. And what concerns me is I'm coming from the outside into Christianity. I grew up believing there was no God, being taught and very secure in believing uh, evolution, being an atheist, if not at least an agnostic. And I probably went back and forth between the two. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Get on with it. To a position where now I believe firmly in divine creation, in a recent creation. I'll give you reasons for that. And it changed my life. It gave purpose to my life. After this, he talks a bit about hitting Alt F4 on his own life processes. And since that's neither relevant nor YouTube friendly, we'll skip it. I believe in creation now, not just because the Bible teaches it, because when I first read the Bible, I tried to fit evolution in with the Bible. Because I was sure that you just had to be an ignoramus to believe in divine creation because I couldn't explain it. In general, divine creation? No, I wouldn't say that. But to believe in your Earth creation style special creation with a flood some 4,400 years ago? Yes, you would have to be an ignoramus. In the literal sense of someone who is very ignorant. I also want to note that once again, we have someone who converted to Christianity, and then only after gaining that motive to reject science, becomes a young Earth creationist. Weird how we never get people convinced first by all the mountains of scientific evidence, only to then discover that Christians were teaching that very thing. But the more I've studied, the more illogical evolution seems to me. And I've come where it's the only thing I'm left believing. It's, to me, the best answer scientifically. See, this is just a pragmatics problem. What does the word it refer to there? Creation? Evolution? It's not really clear. I believe that there are good reasons in geology, biology, archaeology, paleontology that all support creation. I would love to hear them, but it's been a lot of talk and not a lot of evidence so far, Doug. And I'd like to look at some of these things with you. Uh, I believe, in fact, that it does take faith to believe, a certain amount of faith, in creation. I believe it takes much more faith to believe in evolution. Well, if by faith we mean believing things for bad reasons, then yes. The whole thing is faith. Because there is literally no evidence for young Earth creationism and literally actual physical mountains of evidence precluding it. One example is El Capitan in Texas, an actual mountain made out of more coral than could possibly exist if young Earth creationism were true. We can demonstrate the miracles of life all around us. We are surrounded with abundant evidence that life is miraculous in the systems, in the relationships. Uh, life is miraculous. Ah, yes. Nothing like mutualistic symbiosis could possibly exist. I mean, it's not like something that favors the survival and reproduction in more than one species could be selected for by natural selection. But let's get into an example. Pollination by nectivorous specialists such as some bats, insects, and hummingbirds. The earliest identifiable flowering plants like Archifructus had no specialized structures to allow for pollination, just simple reproductive systems that compared to modern flowers barely qualify as such. In these plants, as in many modern plants, fertilization was accomplished by the wind, but pollen, which is plant sperm, is full of nutrition and made by wind-fertilized plants in abundance. Many animals today and in the past eat pollen. Pollen also sticks to things, as if it didn't, it couldn't fertilize seeds. This includes animals that eat pollen. And where do animals that eat pollen like to go? Well, between pollen-bearing plants. If while doing this they take pollen from one plant to another and it brushes onto the female reproductive organs of the second plant, that animal just facilitated those two plants reproducing with each other. Well, this sets up an immediate selective pressure on the plants to do things like produce more pollen or modify leaves to support pollen-eating animals so that they preferentially pick up pollen from the plants that are easier to eat from. Sure, this spends some resources on pollen that is being eaten rather than going on to fertilize other plants, but as long as the net reproductive output is increased, which is likely because this increases the genetic diversity through outcrossing, this is still selected for. And that's how simple it is. Now plants have a selective pressure to become more inviting for pollinators, and pollinators have a selective pressure to continue to eat at these basically free buffets set up by flowers. To deny this, one would basically have to just reject the idea that phenotypes and genotypes are linked, or that mutations happen. Curiously, creationists tend not to do this, and just instead pretend that mutations can't provide new functions for no explainable reason. To explain that all of these miracles came from nothing requires a great deal of faith. 
It is always strange to me that people who dogmatically believe in creation ex nihilo are those who complain most loudly about what a problem believing the universe came from nothing is. I certainly don't claim that the universe was ever nothing. I don't know enough to make that claim. I'm not sure anyone else does either. But also, evolution isn't dependent on any particular cosmogenic scenario. Once the universe is in a state where it has biological organisms, evolution is off to the races. How it got to that stage is irrelevant to evolution. Just like exactly how one grows broccoli and semolina wheat and how one makes cheese is irrelevant to my recipe for cheesy broccoli pasta. If I have the ingredients for my pasta, the exact manner those ingredients were created makes no difference to my ability to cook it a pasta. Why are evolutionists so passionate? And why am I passionate about science? Well, for one thing, nothing has done more to increase the well-being of humans in human history than science. Most people on Earth wouldn't be allowed if not for science helping heal their injuries, cure their diseases, and allowing high-yield farming to feed them. And the thing is, evolution helps with this. It helps direct research on pathogens based on prior research on related pathogens. It helps scientists model the spread of diseases like the recent pandemic. I'm sure my audience remembers. It helps scientists create new crop strains and far more effective pesticides that are safer for humans and more dangerous for pests, etc. I also feel some resentment for having been lied to by creationists for the most impressionable years of my life. Also, I've had a lifelong passion for learning, and one of the great things about science is that there's so much to learn that I can spend my whole life learning about it and not even be close to running out of things to learn. And not only that, but the things I learn are actually, you know, well supported by evidence. Not that I don't also like investigating the lore of fiction I like, but there's something much more immediate and compelling about investigating the real world. Also, I admit there's something amusing about showing up intellectual idiots and charlatans, which is what this channel does a lot. You know, in recent years, as increasing evidence has grown for divine creation or at least intelligent design, actual acceptance of such ideas has declined. Almost like evidence for young earth creationism has actually not grown. And the only way to think that it has is if you're in the little bubble of young earth creationist propaganda. Uh, atheists, I was doing a little more study this week in preparation for the message, and I, the vitriol and the anger that evolutionists and atheists have against creationists is palatable. I can't speak about atheists as a group, since, well, they're not really one in any meaningful sense. I can say this, though. It's pretty easy to hate misinformation, especially when it harms people. Creationism is associated with broader science nihilism, like anti-vax conspiracies, climate change denial, and faith healing. Unlike just believing something silly like the Earth being 6,000 years old, rejecting the science on these things can directly kill not only the person who believes them, but also others with their ignorance. Like those who cannot get vaccinated because of weakened immune systems, or the poorest people in the world who are least equipped to deal with climate change, or people who need real medical treatment only to go to some quack faith healer to get fake spiritual surgery, all while their disease is progressing untreated. Once you believe one conspiracy theory like young earth creationism, you're likely to believe more. Like that Dr. Fauci is a New World Order plant trying to kill off the population with Bill Gates microchips and vaccines, or other similarly insane conspiracy theories. This isn't some little game to play with the ignorant. Real people have their real lives on the line when it comes to pseudoscience. All of it needs to be pushed back, because once any pseudoscience puts its nose under the tent, the whole camel of dangerous pseudoscience bull isn't far behind. It's, it's really caustic and mean. I try not to be caustic or mean. That being said, when you're leading the charge for dragging the human race back into the 14th century intellectually, you should expect some pushback from people who like things like, oh, I don't know, being f***ing alive. And you think, what? This is a bad spirit. It's just, it's hateful. Oh no, I'm being tone policed and called hateful by a homophobe. Hey, uh, pot? This is Kettle. Also, yes, there's a link in the description to where Doug goes through the reasons he thinks homosexuality is bad. You'll have to forgive me if I don't care that a raging bigot thinks I'm being mean. And, you know, I'll tell you why I think that is. Oh, good. He's now going to tell me about my motives, because he knows me better than I know myself, even though we've never met. I'm very quickly losing any charity for this guy, and technically, I don't think he's even made an argument yet. Let's start with the beginning. A very good place to start. We're all here. Okay, I agree so far. Let's assume that we don't just imagine that we're here. We really are here. Let's assume we really are alive. I'm going to assume that I'm not, you're not just a figment of my imagination in this universe I live in, that you also have perceptions. You're real. We get it. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Yeah! 
Get on with it! How did we get here? Yeah, we're like five minutes into the speech and we're finally getting around to the point. If it is by design and there's a God, then that means that we are accountable to God and we will give an answer to God someday for the lives that we live. That doesn't follow at all. There could be a God who just doesn't care about what you get up to. That a God exists doesn't make it the Christian God. That means you can't just do whatever feels good, that you are not just an animal, that there are morals, there are rights, and there is something that is defining right and wrong, and there is a judgment day, and people really chafe at the idea they need to answer to God for their lives. So they try to remove God from the equation so they can do whatever feels good. This is all just Doug swimming in a tank of copium like a spacing guild navigator because he can't fathom the idea that there are people out there that find the claims of his religion implausible. Also, if you're playing bingo and you have, you only believe in evolution because you're horny, you can check that box. Fun fact, just because your religion is seen as implausible by some people, doesn't make them hypocrites who just want to sin. It means that different people are convinced by different things for different reasons. Even if your religion be true, it still doesn't mean that the people who reject it do so for reasons other than sincerely not finding the truth claims convincing. You'd be surprised how closely tied atheism evolution, and hedonism are. Wow, I've been going to the wrong evolution parties. Damn. I'll have to ask hedonism bot where the cool evolution parties are next time. I apologize for nothing. So, looking back just one century, it's still amazing to us that you could have such a sophisticated, intelligent, educated people as the German people. Oh, God, we're about to hear about the National Socialist German Workers Party, aren't we? You know, that party run by the guy who historians are very confident was a creationist who rejected evolution, although he probably wouldn't be a creationist in the same way as modern young earth creationists. The Nazi fascism did not come from some uneducated uh, jungle somewhere. Hell, we're skipping past Doug comparing people who don't reject science to genocidal governments because it's disgusting, and even if it were a fair comparison, it's just another appeal to consequences, so it's completely fallacious anyway. Creationists don't be pieces of Challenge level impossible. And no, I don't actually think all creationists are giant piles of anthropoid dog turds like this guy, but holy cow does it seem to be common. We all hear about Darwin's book called The Origin of Species. That wasn't the whole title. Let me read to you the whole original title. Who wants to bet that he'll just imply that the title means that evolution is racist because the title includes the phrase favorite races and never go on to explain the fact that at no point in the book are human origins or races discussed. The origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Well, they delete that from all the modern printings of the book. That's weird, because the title page for the 2019 edition by Canon Press in Moscow, Idaho, has the full title on the copyright page and the title page. It's almost like rather than trying to hide the title, it's just hard to fit that ridiculously long title on a book cover that doesn't look terrible by modern standards. Let's check chapter one to see what races we're talking about. Well, we have domestic races in reference to animals and plants, the races of cabbages, dog races like spaniels, pigeon races, agricultural races, and plant races. Hmm, not seeing a lot of connection to human races. Maybe chapter two will be of more interest. Well, we have bird races, and that's literally it. Chapter three doesn't use the word race at all. Chapter four mentions races of horses. Chapter five is back to pigeon races and horse races. I think you see where this is going. Doug's implication that this book is about human races and racism is simply a lie. One that could be uncovered by just checking. But as he traveled around the world. Now, don't misunderstand. Darwin was against slavery. Unlike the Bible, Doug is trying to prop up, which is not at all against slavery, whether in the Old Testament or the New. Good to know that Darwin was doing better than a literalist reading of the Bible would do in terms of morality, even according to this Christian. But it wasn't because he did not believe that certain races were inferior. He, he was against slavery because he loved animals. No, he was against slavery because, while thinking of other races as inferior to his own, the ubiquitous position at the time, he thought that all humans were of a dignity too high to be subjected to the abuse and degradation of slavery. In The Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin compared a woman favorably to a Roman matron for her refusal to live as a slave. We also get this famous passage, quote, While staying at this estate, I was very nearly being an eyewitness to one of those atrocious acts which can only take place in a slave country. Owing to a quarrel and a lawsuit, the owner was on the point of taking all the women and children from the male slaves and selling them separately at the public auction in Rio. Interest and not any feeling of compassion prevented this act. Indeed, I do not believe the inhumanity of separating 30 families who had lived together for many years even occurred to the owner. 
Yet I will pledge myself that in humanity and good feeling he was superior to the common run of men. It may be said that there exists no limit to the blindness of self-interest and selfish habit. I may mention one very trifling anecdote, which at the time struck me more forcibly than any sort of cruelty. I was crossing a ferry with a negro who was uncommonly stupid. In endeavoring to make him understand, I talked loud and made signs, in doing which I passed my hand near his face. He, I suppose, thought I was in a passion and was going to strike him, for instantly, with a frightened look and half-shut eyes, he dropped his hands, I shall never forget my feelings of surprise, disgust, and shame at seeing a great, powerful man afraid to even ward off a blow directed, as he thought, at his face. This man had been trained to a degradation lower than the slavery of the most helpless animal. Darwin was a racist by any reasonable modern standard, but he absolutely did not hold that humans of other races should be regarded at the level of brute animals, and explicitly found it disgusting that slavery should lower them to this level of consideration or worse. But again, if Darwin had in fact been the biggest racist in all of history, that wouldn't make evolution false, because evolution isn't some revelation that relies on the character of the prophet who revealed it. It is a scientific theory that is supported by hundreds of thousands of pages of data, experiment, observation, etc. No amount of character assassination of Darwin, no matter how accurate or inaccurate, can do a single thing to challenge the validity of the modern synthesis in evolutionary biology. He traveled around the world. He was a naturalist. He loved animals. He thought... We should be nice to the animals. Weird, then, how we killed animals basically everywhere he went for the purpose of taking them back to England as specimens. But he definitely believed that the aborigines that he saw in Asia, in uh, Australia, and many of the islanders through the Pacific were inferior, and they were not as fully evolved as the Caucasians. Inferior, yes. Less evolved, no. He knew that they had been evolving just as long as his English countrymen had, but they were adapted to different environments, and all through the literature on human racial differences from the 19th century, we see the differences attributed to things like climate, which causes people to develop differently. It does not really make sense to say that among two closely related groups, one is more evolved than the other. Both have been evolving for the same time, just in different environments. It's also important to know that it's modern evolutionary biology and population genetics that have finally dispelled the nonsense of scientific racism or race realism or whatever the racists are calling their ideas today. It certainly wasn't someone waving a Bible around that did it. So that's at the foundation of uh, a lot of racism in the world today. Literally the opposite of what's true, much like the rest of young earth creationism. Now, I believe in uh, intelligent design. I always love it when young earth creationists embrace intelligent design because ID proponents like the Discovery Institute like to keep young earth creationism at arm's length while pretending to be scientific which they were shown not to be in court. They like to pretend that they're following the data to places that scientists won't go and that it has nothing to do with religion, all while circulating the internal memos about getting secularism out of government, taking funds from Christian nationalists, and employing actual young earthers. Then here comes other young earthers just embracing the material, making it even harder to maintain the facade of science. Yeah, intelligent design says that wherever you see some sophisticated design... There must be an intelligence behind it. Sure, but it's not always clear that what you're seeing is a design in the teleological sense, as in a design being something that a designer made. We sometimes call natural phenomena, like fairy circles, snowflakes, or horses, designed, but that's only by analogy. So if something is actually designed, then it's tautological to say that it had a designer, but it is completely illogical to then say that anything that looks like it could have been designed must actually have been designed, and so had a designer. Keep in mind, back in the days when evolution was born, we had very humble scientific instruments. We didn't have the laboratories we have today. Microscopes, when they would look at a cell, they saw what we call a single cell. They could not take the hyper-powerful super electron microscopes that we have now and look at a cell and see all the incredible complexity in that cell. And now we do, allowing scientists to get an even better grasp on what's going on in biology which has obviously diminished confidence in evolution and increased confidence that it had to be magic, right? Oh, nope. Whoops. Evolution is now more firmly established than it was even decades after Darwin's death. Shucks. Seems like all that extra instrumentation did the opposite of helping Doug out. For example, this is back during the time of Louis Pasteur. They would take a lump of meat and they are carcass and they would set it down somewhere. And in a few days, they would see worms and things springing out of the carcass. And they said, see, we watch life form all the time. See how these worms came out of that carcass from nowhere. New life is constantly forming. And Pasteur looked at that and he said, no, 
you're not noticing the flies that are landing on it laying eggs. He then took the same meat or something and he put it in a vacuum environment. Well, it wasn't a vacuum environment. It was just a jar with a cheesecloth cover so flies couldn't reach the meat. Other than that, though, so far this isn't being too badly explained. And there was nothing. And they realized that here's a law. All modern life in the world comes from life. We cannot find a single example anywhere in the observable world where modern life comes from non-life. Right, which means that chances are that however life came about, because remember that both creationists and scientists agree that life is not eternal, it was not by processes that are operating now as they did in the past. So science has decided to use a scientific method and begin investigating chemically possible paths to the origin of the first life, which would not have been much like any modern life. Creationists, on the other hand, would rather there be no scientific inquiry, and that we just accept that life magically popped into existence one day, with no possible chemical process that could lead up to it. That is, it came into existence in a way that we would normally find impossible. Since that idea provides us with nothing falsifiable, since if you know it was impossible, but you accept it anyway, literally nothing can falsify that belief, and since as far as I know, it makes no useful predictions to suggest further research, even if it's the right answer, it's not scientific and should be ignored in science. We are enabled with all of our sophisticated laboratories and equipment to produce life from non-life. And we're not able to produce a hurricane from a non-hurricane in a lab either. Turns out the ability of humans to do a thing in a lab has no bearing on whether such a thing can happen outside of a lab or whether they require a god. And as much as scientists can do now with modifying seeds and genes and strains of crops and artificial insemination. And there's wonderful th things that medicine can do now that I, you know, the things that they do with blood transfusions to heal people. And it's all fascinating to me. And I have great respect for legitimate science. Don't misunderstand. No, he doesn't. He only has respect for the parts of science that don't contradict his conclusions that he came to about his religion, ignoring the scientific evidence. Too bad for him that it turns out that that's basically none of science. Even the medicine he's lauding uses evolution to advance. But you're aware that in spite of all of that, they are still not able to produce one single cell of life artificially. And if scientists ever do, the creationists will just say that all that does is show it takes intelligence to make life. So ha ha, whether you can create life in a lab or not. Either way, it proves that it needed God to do it the first time. They say it happened all over the world spontaneously. Who says that life formed all over the world? I've never heard that advocated for by a scientist. I love a citation, but I feel like I won't get one. Without any intelligence. That part, yes. But it takes intelligence to, to have interworking systems and organization and uh, life. Does it, though? Because we have seen the evolution of interworking systems in life in human history. Look at tethering antagonism in HIV by the VPU protein that evolved probably in the 1950s or so, when HIV evolved from SIV. Or for a more recent example, in viruses, look at the ability of COVID-19 spike proteins to attach to human cell membranes, which happened sometime in 2019. Did God step in to create these new viruses by tinkering with their ancestors? I mean, I guess we could say that, but the changes are easily explicable with traceable mutations, so there's no need to invoke God. Point number three, the complexity of life. There is so much complexity. I just alluded for a moment ago to a single cell. Now when we take our high-powered microscopes and we look at a single cell, where once we saw what you see when you look at an egg, you see a shell, the cell wall, and you see the, uh, the uh, contents inside the white, and then you see the yolk, the nucleus, and that's what they saw when they used to look at eggs, uh, at cells. Just very simple things. Eggs are cells that are just as complex as any other cell, but also evolution predicts that complexity will arise. If more complex features are favorable to differential reproductive success, then they will be selected for. And even in cases where they are not, they can arise through neutral evolution. See this video by Dr. Zach B. Hancock for a more in-depth look at the non-adaptive evolution of complexity. By way of a summary of that video, however, complex is interestingly correlated with lower population size and hence higher dominance of genetic drift relative to selection pressure. This also allows things like gene duplication and subsequent mutation in separate genes to cause the organism to go from one protein doing a job to two interacting proteins doing the same job but together, and in some cases, in such a way that the system cannot do without both proteins. This is generally less fit than a simple one-protein solution, and so it is well explained by genetic drift, where mutations with low deleterious effect can nevertheless fix in a population as a result of sampling error. In fact, 
One of the primary principles of design in engineering is that simplicity is to be preferred. No one wants a Rube Goldberg machine with hundreds of points of failure in order to get their jobs done. The less complex the solution, the less likely it is to fail, and the better the design tends to be, provided the goal is still accomplished. The extreme complexity of the eukaryotic cell is far from the hallmark of incredible design. Rather, it is demonstrative of the slapdash manner in which evolution tends to proceed when natural selection is relaxed even a bit relative to genetic drift. Now we know with our microscopes, there are worlds, there are cities that are moving and swimming inside a single cell. There are machines, there are transportation systems, there are communication systems, there are chemical systems all within one cell of life. We know that the DNA, the reproductive system that it has inside a single cell that triggers when it should split and reproduce itself, is extremely sophisticated. Do you think this guy knows that saying, look at the cells, isn't really any more compelling than look at the trees? That things are neat or complex is not on its own evidence for design or God. That's just an argument from incredulity. Doug can't see how anything but a super smart guy could cause a cell to exist. Therefore, he rejects all other options. Well, it turns out that neither Doug's nor anyone else's refusal or inability to understand science makes science wrong. One scientist put it this way. Picture New York City at rush hour. I'm serious. Think about New York City at rush hour. I've been there. Grew up there. Did you drive much in the 20th century, Fry? Nope. No one in New York drove. There was too much traffic. You've got more happening under New York City at rush hour than you have happening in all of Sacramento <laughs> during the day. Burn on the capital of California, I guess. I mean, it's very busy. You've got not only the subways going, you've got the plumbing that goes underneath the city, and you've got the fresh systems and the sewage systems, the electrical systems, and the... Jeez, we get it. Get to a damn point already. I'm skipping the rest of this analogy until he makes a point. I have to suffer through it, but I won't make you do that. He just ends this rant by saying that cells are busier than New York during rush hour, which... I don't care to verify or dispute. Now, what are the chances that lightning could strike a puddle four billion years ago, pick your date, it doesn't matter, and produce spontaneous cells of life? Roughly zero, which is why no current hypothesis for the origin of life involves life popping out of a puddle after a lightning strike. Imagine if creationists actually had to argue against real science instead of the straw men they erect in its place. If it is that simple, why can't we reproduce that scientifically? It's not that simple, and to my knowledge, the current goal of no origin of life research is to create life de novo in a lab. The science isn't at that point yet, and I think that there are ethical concerns to be hashed out about creating life in a laboratory. But further, the inability of humans to recreate a natural phenomenon does nothing to tell us about whether such a phenomenon requires some intelligent agency to come about. For example, again, no one can create a hurricane in a laboratory, and yet we know how and why they form and we don't need an intelligent agent to explain hurricanes. The human ability to accomplish a task or lack thereof is in no way evidence for or against the ability of an entity like God to do so, nor is it evidence for or against such a being having done so in the past. It's simply a non-issue. It should be ignored by all sides in such discussions as these. Why would we teach as fact something we cannot demonstrate scientifically? To my knowledge, no one is teaching as a fact that life started with a lightning hit a puddle. That being said, we know more now than ever about the possible routes by which life came about, and the research is looking promising. Further, we have overwhelming evidence of the great antiquity of the Earth and the lesser antiquity of life on it, and even good indications of when life became somewhat common on Earth, as well as the fact that it by all appearances did not exist when Earth first formed. The only reasonable conclusion to make from a scientific standpoint is that life developed on Earth between the formation of Earth and when we first see evidence of life in the geological record. On the other hand, we don't have any empirical evidence for miracles, nor does God seem like the kind of thing that could be investigated that way anyway what with the ability to simply hide perfectly. So that option is completely unscientific. Isn't that unscientific? Uh, no. <laughs> if we say, oh yeah, this happened, this we know. All right, show me. As a general rule, I can't show you the formation of intrusive igneous rock in a lab. Does that mean that magma doesn't actually intrude into rock layers, then slowly cool? Of course not. This is an absurd standard of evidence. And note that if you ask him to show you God in a test tube, he'll decline. Rules for thee, but not for me, isn't how science works. We have not been able... Oh, they've, you know, they've zapped amino acids and they've arranged certain proteins. They haven't created a single cell of life in a laboratory. I'll translate that for you. What he means is, oh yes, yeah, scientists have shown how basically all important biomolecules can form abiotically in prebiotically relevant conditions, but they have not as yet assembled them into a new life form. And yeah, that's true, but so what? And further, this talk is entitled Evolution, Creation, and Logic. And guess how much prebiotic events have to do with the diversification of life over time, which is basically what evolution is. 
That's right, they have nothing to do with it. Even if life couldn't form on Earth in any naturalistic way, that doesn't actually do anything to negate the knowledge we gain about living things from the study of evolutionary biology. Evolutionary biology doesn't depend on any particular origin of life any more than the oxygen theory of fire depends on how fusion works. If you have life, you get evolution. If you have free oxygen and fuel, you can get fire. Where the life initially came from and where or how the oxygen initially formed doesn't matter. I sometimes use the analogy of a recipe, like I've already done. You don't really need to know exactly how wheat farming works in order to know how to bake bread. In fact, if you were struggling to get baking right, you'd probably find someone incessantly telling you that unless you have an in-depth knowledge of nitrogen fixation in wheat fields, that you'll never successfully bake bread to be obnoxious in the highest degree. All life comes from pre-existing life. And to have life, I got a little illustration here I want to... Hey Doug, you're allowed to finish sentences, my guy. What is this from? Can I help you? We got on a detour off the highway and cell service around here. Got your here family is... with you? Yeah. I was wondering if you could point me in the direction of the highway. Not a problem. A sophisticated piece of equipment they don't make anymore. This is, uh, how many of you remember these? I remember egg beaters, and they absolutely still make hand crank gear based egg beaters. A quick check on Amazon, the great monopsony, for egg beaters reveals that on the first page of 52 results, 10 are such devices, including the second result. Not everyone feels that all devices need a plug to work. I happen to be one of them. It took years of nagging by friends for me to even get a microwave, because I still see little use for one. Sorry that Dougie doesn't seem to realize that just because his egg beaters are antiques, that doesn't make hand crank egg beaters obsolete around the world. Now they're all, you know, black and decker. But just to, to illustrate a point, you have in, uh, this is the old fashioned egg beater. Yeah, we all figured it out. And this one is like over 50 years old, so I gotta be careful. You got like four parts. You got your handle, you got your crank and your gears, you got your two blender doodads that have uh, also gears. It works because they're all assembled with pre-designed purposes so that when you turn it, it uh, accomplishes a desired action. And remind me again, do they reproduce with some kind of genetic material that can vary such that the whole egg beater population can change its form over generations? No, it can't. So it's a piss poor analogy for living things, which can do that, and also which we haven't seen being designed. Not something that can be said of egg beaters, whether hand-operated or electric. If you separate the handle, and you separate the blender parts, and you separate the gear and the crank, they have no purpose anymore. Red alert! Incoming irreducible complexity. Man your battle stations. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Red alert. All hands to battle stations. There are so many cells of life where you've got a motor. Do you know that there are cells that propel themselves? They, they swim. They got tails that turn, and they got motors, and they actually have biological gears inside. It's like one day someone told him the term bacterial flagellum was too fancy. For them to all come together to work, they would all have to be complete. Any of these things incomplete as you see them now serve no purpose and they would not work. Oh no, it's irreducible complexity. Who could have predicted this? Oh, right. Me. Anyway... There are more problems with irreducible complexity than you can shake a stick at. The first one is that it ignores all evolutionary mechanisms besides natural selection and mutation. But complexity can come about through neutral evolution and then become irreducibly complex. That is what I call the scaffold explanation for irreducible complexity in life. You see, an arch is a tricky thing to build. Because if you remove any one stone from an arch, the whole thing collapses, and you can't simply build an arch one stone at a time, because it's not stable until it's complete. This means that an arch is irreducibly complex. So you might ask, how do people build them? Well, as you may have guessed, with scaffolds. The arch doesn't hold itself up until the final stone is placed and then the scaffold is removed. Similarly, functions can be split between independently mutating copies of a gene in a genome. Some of these mutations can make it so that some of the copies are less effective at certain parts of a given process, but good or even better at other parts. At this point, an organism has a series of functional genes for a given function, all of which are producing proteins of various efficiencies but any one of which could stand on its own. This ability to stand on its own means that the scaffold is in place. But as each protein starts to drift away from the universal functionality, the scaffold is dropping. Eventually, these collections of proteins need to be present as a whole collection, or the function that was once done by one protein will suddenly cease to operate without the whole group present. This increases complexity and makes the system performing the function irreducibly complex. 
Another mechanism for the evolution of such systems is acceptation, where an organ or biochemical that was used for one purpose, where it evolved complex structure via natural selection, will then be co-opted for a new function while retaining the previous complexity. An example of something that's supposed to be irreducibly complex, even though we have reduced forms of it, is the mammal blood clotting chain, which uses many proteins, while other animals get by just as well with a few blood clotting proteins. Another option is that neutral evolution can occur, which primes an organism for a final mutation which allows a new and irreducible function. We can see this in the evolution of HIV group 1 from SIV-CPZ, that is, the chimpanzee simian immunodeficiency virus. In one SIV-CPZ lineage, during the early 20th century, there were a series of mutations in the gene for the VPU protein that didn't really do anything. But then a fourth mutation occurred, and it allowed the protein to antagonize human tetherin, which allowed it to infect humans, a new and much larger group of hosts. It didn't evolve stepwise with subtle improvements to tetherin antagonism. It just happened neutrally at first with no tetherin antagonism. But then, bam, one final mutation, and there you go. Human tetherin is no longer a problem. A similar thing occurred in Ascaria coli in the now famous CIT plus line of E. coli in the Lensky long-term E. coli experiment. A series of mutations, none of which on their own had any function, taken together allowed a strain of bacteria in the experiment to metabolize citrate in the presence of oxygen, something that E. coli characteristically cannot do. So this was also macroevolution, as well as the evolution of an irreducibly complex trait. Now hold up, a creationist might say. That some irreducibly complex systems can evolve doesn't mean any of them can. To this I simply say, hey, that's a fun unfalsifiable argument you have there. The claim that evolution can't be true unless any and every irreducibly complex system has a known evolutionary history just means that until biology reaches omniscience, we would have to disregard evolution. And since we will never reach omniscience, evolution must be wrong, actually. I don't think I need to go into depth about why that unfalsifiable version of this hypothesis has no scientific merit and is properly disregarded. So much of life is full of examples of things like this where they only operate as they come together in unison. There would be no explanation scientifically how all of these pieces would come together without a purpose. Neutral evolution really does cover most of it, and later selection can help quite a bit. Would this gear ever say, I'm going to grow into a gear because one day I'm going to marry up with blender pieces and a handle and I'm going to make a cake? Egg beaters aren't living things that reproduce with imperfect heritability, so it doesn't matter what they do when the question is about entities that are in fact living things that reproduce with imperfect heritability. Would the handle ever say, you know, I'm going to grow into this shape as a handle because I'm just anticipating that I'm going to fall into position someday with the gear and the blender parts, and we're going to whip cream. Egg beaters aren't living things that reproduce with imperfect heritability, so it doesn't matter what they do when the question is about entities that are in fact living things that reproduce with imperfect heritability. No, they all had to be together with a design for a purpose from the beginning. Cells are infinitely more complex than this egg beater. Which is a point against design. Would anyone want a hand crank egg beater that used 40 score gears just on the ground that it was thereby more complex? I sure wouldn't. That's just more points of failure and more moving parts that reduce efficiency. And as we know with things like the simpler ribosomes or prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, or the vastly simpler blood clotting mechanism of many non-mammals, much of modern life could be vastly simplified with no obvious deleterious effect, and quite probably a slight beneficial effect. The complexity of life might suggest to the intuition that it had to be designed, but intuition is a terrible guide in science. Intuition tells you that the world is flat, the sky rotates around the earth, that the rate of time's passage does not vary with relative speed, and that big heavy things fall faster than small light things. We know all of these things to not be true, despite the fact that they were the universal conclusions early humans came to when using their basic intuition about the world. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just a stupid point. And they have interworking parts that all have a purpose, and they would never come together spontaneously or accidentally to do that. In the form of an egg beater? No. In the form of a biological system, we've seen irreducibly complex systems evolve in real time in recorded history under various levels of observation. Irreducible complexity is on the garbage heap of failed scientific hypotheses and theories with spontaneous generation, vitalism, Phlogiston theory, the theory of the humors, flat earth, and geocentrism. That's just one simple design. You've probably heard the example of the mouse trap before. I just wanted to be different, so I didn't use a mouse trap. I got an egg beater. But it's the same principle. Ah, uh, yes, the mouse trap. This was the example used by Michael Behe in his book Darwin's Black Box, which is the book that coined the term irreducible complexity. I would say he invented the argument, except that Behe himself said in court in the Kitzmiller v. Dover trial, it was indeed based on the watchmaker argument put forth by William Paley in the 19th century. Behe likes to say that his idea about irreducible complexity and intelligent design are simply scientific, but again, in the same trial he said, and I quote here, 
The plausibility for the argument for ID depends on the extent to which one believes in the existence of God, end quote. As you might or might not know, one of the best things about science is it does not matter what your religion is as a scientist if your work is good, and it doesn't matter what your religion is to the conclusions of science, because they are based on empiricism and they don't care about your religion. If your idea only works with certain religious beliefs, it's not really science. Indeed, the judge in the case notes in his opinion, again quoting, as no evidence in the record indicates that any other scientific position's validity rests on belief in God, nor is the court aware of any such scientific propositions, Professor Behe's assertion constitutes substantial evidence that in his view, as is commensurate with other prominent ID leaders, ID is a religious and not a scientific proposition, end quote. Rather hilarious, the court also found that Dr. Behe just ignored acceptation, the process by which a structure or system evolved to perform one function can be co-opted for another relatively unrelated function, such as the evolution of a leg into an arm into a wing in the case of the evolution of flight in birds. Further, Behe's favorite examples of irreducible complexity are the bacterial flagellum, the blood clotting cascade, and the immune system. And in court, extensive peer-reviewed studies were presented explaining how these things did in fact evolve, thereby falsifying irreducible complexity as a criticism of evolution, not just in the scientific literature, but also amusingly in court. Let me read the, the conclusion of the court. Quote, we therefore find that Professor Behe's claim for irreducible complexity has been refuted in peer-reviewed research papers and has been rejected by the scientific community at large. Additionally, even if irreducible complexity had not been rejected, it still does not support ID, as it is merely a test for evolution, not design. End quote. Lastly, I'll note that it was in what, as far as I know, is now a deleted live stream, that I personally got to ask Dr. Behe if he thought intelligent design could pass a court's test as to what was science versus what was religion based on how the test was applied in Kitzmiller v. Dover, a case that at the time was some decade and a half old. His answer was that no, it could not. Dr. Behe doesn't even believe this idea is scientific. I think I've beaten this already very dead horse enough. And so then you also look in life, and by the way, this is called uh, irreducible complexity. Yeah, we know. It wasn't really hard to figure out. Once you get it down to its simplest forms, you can't break it down any smaller. None of it works without the other. It all had to come together as a working unit. Good thing such things can evolve. I guess science dodged that bullet. There's no explanation in evolution for that. And by the way, that theory was developed by an evolutionist who said it doesn't make sense. Evolution doesn't make sense. I wonder what Dr. Behe would think of being called an evolutionist, given how much time he has dedicated to attempting to discredit evolution, both in his books and in a trial over school curricula. Normally, creationists don't make up nonsense about each other. Interesting to see it happening here. Then you have nature is full of what you would call symbiotic relationships, where different plants and animals and creatures cannot survive without the help of coexisting in some way with others. They, they depend on each other. This isn't in the least a problem for evolution. In fact, it's almost trivial for mutualistic symbiosis to evolve. Let's look at the example of Homo sapiens and Canis lupus. The association between the two species as cooperative rather than competitive started sometime at the end of the Pleistocene. And remember that if the claim is X could not evolve, all that needs to be done is to show a single plausible way for X to evolve, and that objection is overcome. And that is what I will give now, a plausible explanation. Wolves like food, and are generally less picky than humans. And just like wild wolves, foxes, and coyotes do now, they were certainly willing to steal food from human middens or trash heaps. Some humans are likely to shoo such animals away, and others leave extra food out. But it's pretty clear to see that humans are more wont to intentionally feed animals that they think of as friendly or cute. So those wolves that were the least aggressive to humans and who acted the friendliest and who took the cutest are the ones who are most likely to find humans a reliable source of food. They will also tend to be near humans, creating a bit of a physical separation between the human-following wolves and their human-shunning kin. So now, human-following wolves are more likely to mate with each other, and the population is under selection pressure to become more and more integrated with humans. Additionally, humans in groups with human-following wolves are inadvertently given an alarm system to protect against large and potentially dangerous animals, since the wolves will also be alarmed by such animals and will bark and growl to alert their packmates. And will bark and growl to alert their packmates. This means that humans living with these proto-dog wolves will tend to be safer. From here, mutualism is established, and boom, next thing you know, we have Dobermans, Dachshunds, and Dalmatians. There are plants that, and trees that just will not survive and pollinate without bees. That's true. But let's see if we have a plausible pathway for symbiosis between flowering plants and pollinators, including bees. So let's take a look at the earliest known flowering plant, Archifructus. It barely had flowers, and the flowers didn't really have petals, which are in fact modified leaves. It almost certainly did not have any dedicated pollinators, and it spread its pollen by the wind, as many plants still do. That's why if you get hay fever, you probably keep track of how much pollen is in the air. It's in the air because many plants still use wind dispersal for their reproduction. 
but pollen is very nutritious. In fact, some humans even eat it, so there will be few insects that would pass on a pollen meal. Incidentally, if an insect is eating pollen, it is very likely to have some of that pollen adhere to its exoskeleton or hair. If such an insect flies to another plant to eat pollen there, it will likely deposit some of the first plant's pollen, which may directly fertilize the second plant's seeds. This is more efficient than wind dispersal, and so there's now a selection pressure for pollen that sticks to insects better, as well as a selection pressure to attract insects. In the meantime, there's pressure on the insects to evolve ways to recognize and favor those plants with the best meals. So now we're seeing a pressure to create things like colorful petals, large sticky clusters of pollen, and for insects to develop good color vision and the ability to recognize flower species that will provide a good meal. But one thing that's even better than insects eating pollen is them leaving the pollen uneaten to be further used for fertilization, and instead, for them to just take some of the plant sugar. That's nectar, by the way. There are plants that cannot survive without, you know, there's a certain flower that it cannot pollinate without one particular moth that's got a very long proboscis that it uses and it gets down and it goes just to those flowers. Just that flower needs just that moth in order to survive. And there's no scenario that you can create through history that would create uh, an example for why that would be necessary. In fact, the moth is called Xanthopan morgani predicta, a subspecies of Wallace's sphinx moth from Madagascar. You probably find that subspecies name, predicta, a bit unusual. Well, that moth feeds on the orchid Angraecum sesquipedale, also known as Darwin's orchid. This is because this orchid has an extremely long spur and cannot readily be fed on by any pollinators known to Darwin, but he used his knowledge of the evolution of mutualism to predict that a moth would be discovered with a proboscis long enough to feed from A. sesquipedale. I'm not sure why Doug thinks that using one of the most famous vindications of evolutionary theory is a point against evolution. You've got the, there are birds and animals that coexist, and they protect and watch out for each other. Yep, famously gray wolves and ravens are great pals, and ravens even play with wolf pups. Ravens also narc on coyotes near wolf packs, but what do the ravens get? Well, the wolves let them eat their scraps. It's essentially the same dynamic that created the dog from the population of wolves, Except in this case, the ravens seem like they might be the ones who are being domesticated by the wolves, despite being the smarter species. You go in the ocean and you've got everything from the sea anemone that lives with a clownfish and it stings everything but the clownfish and the clownfish protects and cleans the anemone. And the clownfish does not clean the anemone except in the sense of occasionally eating a damaged tentacle. Instead, it poops into its mouth, thereby feeding it. Isn't nature wonderful? And this isn't a hard relationship to understand either. First, clownfish are not just naturally immune to anemone stings. When encountering a new anemone, a clownfish will indeed be stung. In fact, it has to be exposed to the anemone's mucus for long enough for it to start producing similar mucus before the anemone will stop stinging it. And this process takes time and involves being stung. Why would this develop at all? Well, it's pretty clear that being resistant to anemone stings is useful. And while the clownfish isn't immune, it is less susceptible to the stings than our other fish. Similarly, anything that reduces the amount of stinging is also useful. So the ability to biochemically mimic anemones is also clearly useful. Further, it's not true that clownfish need anemones or vice versa. Both can live perfectly happily without the other. So this mutualism is one of convenience. They just always seem to have had this relationship. They don't even always have it now. Little birds that ride on the backs of the rhinos and pick off their ticks. And I Birds like to eat ticks and most animals don't like having them sucking their blood. This one doesn't even really need an explanation. If someone came along and pulled the parasites off the part of your back you couldn't reach, you'd probably be pretty chill about it too. I mean, I can just go through it. Now. You got in your belly, I hate to tell you this, but you got bacteria. But the good news is they're friendly bacteria. Let's hope they are. Yeah, you do. And they digest things you can't. And you provide them with a nice place to live. I don't see why this would be a barrier for evolution. Do you think that Doug knows that just listing off examples of mutualism doesn't actually help him with the argument that mutualism is some kind of problem? It just isn't. It's easily explained just on Darwinian terms. Anything that evolution has had a handle on since the 19th century is probably not where you want to look to take the whole theory down. And you need them to help you digest food. And if you take an antibiotic and it kills all the friendly bacteria, then you gotta eat something like yogurt, which shouldn't be eaten by anybody because it's called yogurt. Drink for a joke that didn't land. And that's supposed to help give you friendly bacteria again. And there is, there's so much complexity and interworking systems in life that to say this all happens spontaneously, it doesn't matter if you give it millions or billions of years, it becomes ludicrous. Nope, it's actually a prediction of evolution by natural selection and neutral theory. This would be like someone finding absolute proof of the historical existence of Jesus and his resurrection and then claiming that that's evidence that Christianity is false. And, and I'll get to that in just a minute, some of those other issues connected with that. Then you've got something called the law of entropy. Wow, entropy. 
We really are hitting all the classics, aren't we? This is the second law of thermodynamics. That's true. And basically, it says that nature tends from order to disorder in isolated systems. No, it doesn't, because the concept of entropy does not map well onto the word disorder, nor does a relative lack of it map well onto the concept of order. There are two basic and ultimately equivalent ways to conceptualize entropy. The classical way to think of entropy is how much energy is available to do work. Imagine an isolated internal combustion engine. It cannot gain or lose energy or matter to the outside. It has a supply of oxygen and gasoline or petrol, depending on where you live. Now, we know from the first law of thermodynamics that the total energy in the system must remain constant, but it can be transformed from one type of energy to the other. So imagine that the engine is turning a crank that will lift some weight. We can calculate how much work is done in the system by knowing the mass of the weight and the height to which we can raise it. Right now, all of this is high school physics level stuff, so I'm trusting most of you to follow it. I'll be using easy numbers for this, so work equals force times displacement, and force equals mass times acceleration. Put all together, we get joules, a unit of energy. So if we need to raise a one kilogram weight one meter over a second, we need one newton of force, which is how a newton is defined. Conveniently, this requires one joule. For this, I'm just ignoring gravity because it just complicates the math. If you want to include it, feel free to do the calculations and leave your answers in the comments. Just show your work. Anyway, we need to next look at the energy density of gasoline or petrol, which is 46 megajoules per kilogram. This energy is stored as chemical energy in the bonds between the atoms that make up the gasoline. When these molecules are oxidized, they release energy, which then runs the motor. Let's give our contraption a good but still reasonable efficiency. Let's go with 20%. So that means that for a kilogram of fuel, we can extract 9.2 megajoules of work. That means that we can raise our weight to about 9.2 kilometers, which is quite a way. But remember, I'm just using easy numbers. It seems pretty easy to see that this means that the other 36.8 megajoules of energy in our kilogram of fuel aren't doing work, and when we burn our last bit of fuel, there is no more work that can be done in the system. That energy is essentially entropy. The energy that is in the system that is now not useful for work is what entropy is. Now at this point, we hit more like undergrad physics levels of equations, and we don't actually have the information to calculate the exact value of entropy in the system in joules per kelvin, but this is just about the concept. Okay, so let's think about the quantum concept of entropy. As I'm sure you know, normal matter is composed of atoms, which themselves are composed of electrons, neutrons, and protons, all of which are quantum objects from the atom on down. The exact state of the whole collection of them in a system is called a microstate. The observable classical scale properties of the same system are called the macrostate. You can think of it as analogous to the exact state of each pixel in high resolution image as the microstate, while what the image actually shows is the macrostate. Numerous microstates in an image with enough pixels can result in essentially the same image. Now think of a very high resolution image of something very simple, like a checkers board. There are red and black squares, and they tolerate very few pixels that aren't just red or black before the image stops looking like a checkerboard. This means that the macrostate of a checkerboard image has a small number of microstates that can result in that macrostate. And so it is said to have low entropy. On the other hand, just pure visual noise can be approximated by a huge number of microstates, and so we consider it high entropy. Now, a system left to its own will tend to go to macrostates that have a higher number of microstates that can account for them, simply because there are more of them, and that's how the law of large numbers works. While the physics is over my head, actual experts in this field have worked out that whether you conceptualize energy as the energy in a system unavailable to do work, or as a number of microstates that can account for the macrostate, it actually works out to the same value in classical scales in joules per kelvin. One thing you'll notice is that at no point did I even hint at something to do with order. That's because entropy isn't about order. Now, high entropy systems do tend to look disordered in many cases, and low entropy systems can look ordered, but ultimately order and disorder in most cases are just subjective assessments made by humans, and nature does not care about these concepts. Further, as noted, the second law only strictly applies in isolated systems, that is systems in which neither matter nor energy may enter or leave the system. So even if entropy did map well onto the concept of disorder, if the system under consideration can receive energy or matter from outside, then the law doesn't apply. It's a law of life. Let's suppose that you've got a beautiful garden and it's, you got all the, the rows are carefully um, weeded and everything is in order and you got things stacked. You've got your corn, your tomatoes and your melons, and your zucchini, and it's all growing. It's nice. You got some flowers just for good looks and, and, but you die. You don't tend the garden, you don't water the garden, what happens to the garden? You'll notice that this example doesn't actually have anything to do with the ability of the garden to do work, or in how many microstates can account for the various macrostates of the garden, which means that this is not entropy in the physical sense. It'll all break down to the common denominator of chaos. You got a beautifully built house with a manicured yard, and the owner dies, and no one takes care of the house, what happens? 
Yep. Okay, same deal. I'm going to skip until there's a point being made instead of letting him ramble on about things that are at best just analogous to entropy, but don't actually involve him doing any physics to show how much or little entropy there is in any state for the system. Why the system should be considered isolated, etc. And so in life where you see order and design and structure, there has to be an outside intelligence and power that is introducing that order and design or just defies the law, the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, cool. I actually agree. If I see design, then there must be someone doing the designing. Well, the problem is that I don't see design in the sense of something that needs a specific designer, just like I don't see design in the swirling winds of a hurricane or the craters on the moon. As for order, remember, entropy doesn't just map onto order, so it's a non-issue. And finally, are living things isolated systems? No, in fact, they are not. So the entropy of living organisms does not have to increase with time. It can decrease as a result of the influx of energy. Further, just like the swirling clouds of a hurricane actually increase the entropy of Earth's atmosphere, living things increase the entropy of their environment by capturing energy and using it with limited efficiency in their own bioprocesses. Then you've got a flood of evidence that we're surrounded with around the world. Oh, okay. I kind of expected us to spend a bit more time on entropy, because even on the terms Doug here is using, that was a pretty weak argument. He didn't even try to tie entropy to evolution. He just asserted that because of entropy, things can't be orderly. But hey, sure, let's talk about the flood, I guess. The fossil record around the world says that there was a great flood. Funny how, as far as I can tell, no one ever comes to that conclusion because they looked at the fossil record. Rather, people who believe that all seem to have reached that conclusion based on their reading of a book of scripture, then decided that they needed to fit the actual evidence into the mold of their prior belief. And even people who do believe in a global flood often end up providing evidence against it, like the whole radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth team, aka the Rate team. Doesn't our Bible tell us there's a great flood? I couldn't possibly care less if it did or didn't. The question in science is, what do the empirical data show? It doesn't matter what's in the Bible. The Quran, the Mahabharata, the Ginza, the Guru Granth Sahib, Kitab al-Aqdas, the Eddas, the Book of the Dead, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, Dianetics, the Satanic Bible, or any other holy book. If you can't demonstrate your claim with data alone and without reference to such books, then your claim is not a scientific claim. And I'm about science on this channel. If you want to say, I think there was a great flood as described in the Bible and there's no scientific data to support that, but I believe it anyway, I don't really have a quarrel with you. I might think you're wrong, but so what? It's only when people start trying to overturn science that I really start to care. And I care because pseudoscience is dangerous and believing any kind of pseudoscience, like creationism, makes one more susceptible to other kinds like anti-vax, acupuncture, etc. You know, when you, you talk about what caused the death of the dinosaurs? And I used to study paleontology. My dream, before I became a Christian, I wanted to do paleontology. What the heck does that have to do with being a paleontologist? Doctors Mary Schweitzer and Robert T. Bacher are famously both real paleontologists and faithful and theologically conservative Christians. In fact, Dr. Schweitzer was a young earth creationist before studying paleontology. Odd how that works, isn't it? I had another friend, a girl in school, and she and I, we had dreams that we were going to be paleontologists and travel the world, dig up dinosaur bones, and firmly believed that everything was millions and billions of years old. Let's see how that promising dream got crushed because of something other than the data. And the theory used to be, and I could talk to you about the Tyrannosaurus rex and the Triceratops and the Stegosaurus and the Brontosaurus, and the theory was what caused this mass sudden extermination of the dinosaurs? They said, well, a virus somehow developed. That was never the consensus. It was just a hypothesis that never had much support. Because it happens, you know, we don't know where AIDS come from. Some virus developed and just wiped them all out. We do know where AIDS came from. HIV evolved around the 1930s from the chimpanzee simian immunodeficiency virus and then entered the human population probably via the bushmeat trade in Africa, which caused blood-to-blood -blood contact between a chimpanzee body and a living human. Then that didn't satisfy them. They said, no, there was a shortage of food. There was a famine. They all starved off. That's actually still part of the explanation. Dinosaurs didn't all just die directly from the asteroid impact. Many survived that day to only starve later as their ecosystems collapsed. And then they said... It, the birth of some of the primitive mammal rodents. Well, rodents did evolve in the late Cretaceous, and yes, this was another hypothesis, but again, there was basically no evidence for some significant increase in the loss of eggs at all. Never mind loss of eggs specifically from rodents. But what is the point of mentioning that there are now defunct hypotheses? That's not news. Is astronomy dumb, actually, because the flat Earth and geocentrism were both once leading ideas about how the Earth and sky work? I don't think so began to eat all of their eggs, and it killed them all off. And they had all these theories, but the problem was the evidence, the fossils of the dinosaurs are in copious graveyards where they are covered with silt, which was once mud. They died in a cataclysm of water. Um, no, that's why those hypotheses were abandoned. 
course, is not an accurate way to describe the fossil record of dinosaurs. Most dinosaur finds are not in big mass graves. They are not all found in some waterborne sediment, and some are found in subaerial ash and Aeolian sandstone. And further, virtually none of them are found in rocks that formed in a cataclysm, because in a shocking twist of fate, geologists can tell the difference between a flood-caused turbidite and, say, a slow-deposited shale. So finally, after one excavation after another all over the world, the evidence could not be denied there was some global catastrophe of a flood. So they said, they didn't want to say there was a global flood. So they say, an asteroid struck the Earth and caused a tsunami. No, that isn't even close to what happened. There was no glut of catastrophically buried dinosaurs. In fact, virtually none of them are thought to be preserved after having been killed by the asteroid impact or any subsequent tsunami. Instead, right up until the actual interface between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene, there are dinosaur fossils buried in mostly normal, non-catastrophic rocks. Instead, what was noticed was that there was an anomalously high amount of iridium, a very rare element on Earth that is significantly more common in asteroids, which are one of the only sources of significant amounts of it. Also, a paleo crater was discovered in the Gulf of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula, which is full of things like shock quartz and breccia, things that form, you know, in asteroid impacts. The shock in shock quartz is specifically from impacts. Further tektites were found associated with the cretaceous paleogene boundary, and tektites are bits of black glass associated with asteroid impacts. You see how everything is coming up asteroid? Everything's coming up Millhouse! And also, you see how the impetus for this theory wasn't the need to explain the taphonomy of dinosaurs. In fact, the taphonomy of dinosaurs really played no part whatsoever in the development of the asteroid hypothesis. Because again, the vast majority of dinosaurs are not buried in rocks that can be reasonably ascribed to any catastrophe, never mind a single one that caused their extinction. And here's where I point out that dinosaurs never went extinct, and all you have to do to see them is walk outside pretty much anywhere but the interior of Antarctica. Which caused a flood. No, it caused some tsunamis, but that isn't thought to have caused global flooding, nor is there any extensive flood deposit associated with the boundary in question. And further, the tsunami was strongest in the Americas and the west coast of Europe and Africa. Other parts of the world didn't get any tsunamis. Which, how many of you have heard that now? That's the going theory now. I'm hoping everyone in the audience raised their hand. Well, isn't that what the Bible says? Not an asteroid, but there was a flood. Um, no, because the asteroid didn't cause flooding, by and large. And what flooding it did cause was localized. Well, they can't find that asteroid because it vaporized. This is Behringer Crater, an asteroid crater I visited a couple times in Arizona. It's named for Daniel Moreau Behringer, who bought the land specifically to get at what he hoped would be a treasure trove of meteoric iron. Now, the reason I bring this up is that the crater is so recent that young Earth creationists have to put it post-flood. They can't just blame this on the flood or Noah or anything. So, did Mr. Behringer make it big with a crater-based iron mine? Well, no, because the meteor exploded into mostly microscopic fragments, which is typical. Big hunks of iron after a major impact are actually very unusual. We don't tend to expect to find actual bolides in major impact craters. So this is perfectly in line with expectations. The asteroid that ended the Cretaceous would not survive the impact, and there's essentially no chance of actually identifying anything as part of it. But they say an asteroid hit the world, and it caused a flood, and it wiped them all out because they're all covered with silt in these mass graveyards. You know, except that they're not, but okay. And everywhere you go in the world, I remember I was with, lived, I lived in Nagizi, New Mexico, 8,000 feet. Karen went there with me a few years ago. And they had these massive sections that you could find seashells everywhere. Yes, eastern Arizona and western New Mexico were mostly underwater or in swampy conditions during the Paleozoic and into the Triassic. So this is to be expected. But the seashells are in normal marine deposits, not tsunami or turbidite. They're in things like sandstone with marine crossbedding from tides and sand dunes. Higher up in the Triassic, we start getting fluvial and lacustrine deposits. That is, rocks that look just like the rocks we know form today around rivers and lakes. And hey, sea transgressions are not floods, nor are lakes and rivers. You know, if you go up on the Mount Everest expedition at 20,000 feet, you're going to find giant clams. No, you won't. You'll find large concretions and big, but not what I'd call giant clams, and more frequently brachiopods. And again, they're in non-catastrophic marine sediment, because the uplift of the Himalayas are due to the Indian plate pushing into the Eurasian plate. And guess what was between them before they pushed together? Oh right, ocean floor. In fact, the folding of the ocean sediment is easily visible in parts of the Himalayas, meaning that these fossils were not deposited on these mountains, they were deposited before the folding, because in order to fold sediment, it has to be deposited first. If you deposit sediment on a high relief terrain, it settles into the low parts. It doesn't just evenly coat the hills and valleys. Another thing about it, have you ever seen a pink Himalayan salt? Yeah, that's an evaporite deposit. You know, rocks that form as water evaporates, which is kind of the opposite of what a flood is. Nothing about the Himalayas is compatible with a worldwide flood, and most of it absolutely precludes such an event. That is long way from the ocean. It is now. Not back before the Indian Plate hit the Eurasian Plate, which also interestingly is the way that young Earth creationists think the Himalayas formed. They just pretended it all happened in the span of the one flood year. Way up. And all over the world, we see evidence 
that things were radically changed by a flood. It would be nice if any of this evidence were ever actually presented and turned out to be something other than bullshit. You know how you got to church today, most of you? Dinosaur. Unless they were riding ostriches or giant eagles, Lord of the Rings style, then no. They got here in fossil fuel powered cars, most likely, and fossil fuels are made of plant matter almost exclusively, and most formed before the dinosaurs even evolved. Here's some trivia for you. The word fossil doesn't mean dinosaur remains, and the vast majority of fossils are not dinosaurs. How many of you remember Sinclair Gas? What was the logo for Sinclair Gas? A generic mid 20th century style cartoon sauropod. The little dinosaur, right? Yeah, I guess that's also a description. You know why? Because Sinclair is using the same misconception that Doug has about fossil fuels to sell gas. That's why. They said that the oil came from a prehistoric world that was covered by a flood that turned into these incredibly copious amounts of oil and coal. No one said that. Fossil fuel deposits are from swamps, primarily peat bogs. We have them today, and yes, fossil fuels are forming today. There was no flood involved, just deposition of dead plant matter faster than the plant matter can decay. That's it. That's all it takes. No flood needed. In fact, people burn pre-fossil fuel today. That's why peat is harvested. Now, that use of peat has decreased with the widespread availability of electrical power, but it's still used in some parts of the world out of either tradition or, more rarely, out of necessity. Well, that's what the Bible says happened. Got it. The Bible says that something happened that didn't happen. Not sure why that's the point he's going with, but oh well. And what's interesting is... You know where you find a lot of that? Siberia? Oh my god! It's almost like plate tectonics is a real thing, and what's now Siberia wasn't always a frozen wasteland like Canada. Yeah, I, once? Ferns? I think I had woolly mammoths that died with ferns in their mouth. Ferns live in Siberia today, but also those woolly mammoths are not associated with fossil fuels like oil and coal. That's from much deeper in the earth. It's like he's trying to have the stupidest take possible about everything in geology. It's honestly kind of impressive how badly wrong he can get even basic things. Now, it's Siberia, enough no ferns up there. Really? Well then, explain Polypodium Sibiricum. The Siberian fern. Like, it's actually called that, not just in its common name, but the scientific name of the species. I mean, look, this is a picture from Siberia. It's full of ferns. Has Doug Bachelor just never bothered to check if anything he says is true? It sure does seem like he's never done so. Whole environment of the world was obviously very different from it is today. I mean, yeah, but no one thinks that the current environment in any location on Earth is how it has always been. They've got fossils of dragonflies. By the way, they look exactly like dragonflies today, except their wingspan is 24 inches. In fact, we do not. We have giant griffonflies or meganesopterans. That's an entirely different order of insects. Now, granted, it's probably a sister lineage to Odonata, where we find the actual dragonflies. But that's kind of like calling a beaver a primate. Meganosopterans were distinct from dragonflies in a few ways. The most obvious, perhaps, is that they had prominent cerci in at least some species and a simple vein pattern in the wings with no pterostigma, meaning that they were worse at gliding than most other insects. This is another one of those circumstances where he could have just checked, but for some reason, no, he just didn't. And I'm not even sure that getting this right would negatively impact his rhetoric, so it's just being lazy, I guess. Can you imagine those buzzing around? You'd be scared half to death they'd haul off your kids. Uh, no. <laughs> a dragonfly? Can you imagine how big the mosquitoes must have been? Well, the largest mosquitoes today can exceed 3 millimeters, and the largest species is usually identified as Toxorhynchides speciosus, and is often known as the Australian elephant mosquito because of its range and size. They probably didn't get much bigger than this, as they are primarily nectivorous insects that also need a blood meal to reproduce. Both of these impose size restrictions. If a bloodsucker the size of an eagle were approaching you, you'd probably notice, and it would probably need a lot of nectar. Being small and hard to notice is the way to go for the mosquito. Active predators like griffonflies have an entirely different selection pressure in their niche. That some members of a group were once large is no indication that other particular members of that group must also have been large in the past. Now these are fossils, and, and um, evolutionists will agree with this, that they were there. Yes, yeah, scientists are generally not in the business of denying the existence of fossils. And the mammals, they had beavers 13 feet tall. Castoroides, the largest thing that could reasonably be called a beaver, could get up to about 2.2 meters long. That's pretty damn big, but a far cry from 13 feet tall. But also, these animals are only found in what most creationists would call post-flood layers. So if the explanation for big animals is supposed to be pre-flood conditions, it probably doesn't work for Castoroides. But also, I'm not sure what about the current environment would preclude Castoroides from physically existing. Most animals don't go extinct because Earth physically can't handle an animal so big. They go extinct because of things like habitat loss, new predators, humans, etc. The whole environment was different. There was vegetation all the world was like a garden. 
Well then, I shouldn't be able to find easily identifiable desert deposits in the geological record then. Except, oh no, the Coconino Sandstone and the Dodochta Formation both famously preserved deserts with only sparse vegetation. Oh well, I guess I was wrong. A lot more oxygen. Large amounts of oxygen does indeed explain the existence of large terrestrial arthropods such as Meganeura and Arthropleura, but that's the Carboniferous. The oxygen found in the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic Amber and in ice core bubbles are much more like oxygen levels today, so high oxygen levels cannot explain other large animals like Castoroides. The environment was vastly different, and something cataclysmic happened to our world that was worse than an asteroid. It was the flood of Noah. It says the heavens split. Water came out of the earth great in great jets. Cool story, but we're going to need a lot more than just big beavers and bugs to make that a plausible event. Really, what we need is a globally extensive and correlated layer of turbidite. But, you know, we don't have that. Instead, what we have are extensive layers that cannot have formed in a flood, like limestone, alien sandstone, subaerial tuff, evaporites, etc., etc. Continental drift. All these things changed. And the fossil record tells us exactly what the Bible says, that there was a, a major change about 4,000 years ago. No, remember that he's already identified the Cretaceous as his big change, which means his use of Castoroides, a Pleistocene mammal, odd, but whatever. The thing is that there isn't really a big change in the kind of rocks being deposited on either side of the boundary, called the KPG, because in German, Cretaceous is spelled with a K. The difference is in the biosphere, not the lithography. And further, just sedimentology alone precludes this from being only a few thousand years ago. Just the Green River Formation, an Eocene lacustrine collection of rocks known for exquisite fossils, would have taken too long to form to fit into just 4,000 years, given that it preserves far more varves than that, and those are annual depositional layers in lakes. We don't even have to turn to radiometric dating to know that the young Earth timeline simply does not work. And that's why even early geologists before radiometric dating tended to put the minimum age of the Earth at tens of millions of years, and the age of the Mesozoic at at least a few million years ago. That totally disrupted the world. There's a flood of evidence that supports that. Weird how none is ever produced. What about the living fossils? I'm predicting we get the coelacanth, horseshoe crabs, maybe sharks, and maybe triops. Although for some reason, Triops doesn't seem to get any love from creationists, which isn't fair. They're very cool and very basal. This to me, I think, is very interesting. For instance, on the screen here, you're going to see that's a coelacanth. This doesn't count as a prediction. It was already on screen, but yes, it is a coelacanth. A coelacanth, they found these fossils in different parts of the world. They said these were ancient creatures, 65 million, based on the fossils, they say they lived 65 million years ago. No, fossil coelacanths went extinct 66 million years ago, but they are known to have existed 410 million years ago. So, you know, from the Devonian until the end Cretaceous. And the thing is that the vast majority of them did not survive to today. We have only two species in a single genus, both in deep water, unlike the shallow water coelacanths from the fossil record. And those little stubby fins they have are proto-legs. That means they would crawl along on the bottom of the seafloor and they were gradually developing legs that would someday crawl out on the land. Incorrect. Coelacanths are, like tetrapods, lobe fin fish, but they are separated from the ancestors of tetrapods by more than 20 million years before the first tetrapods. I have never been able to find anything indicating that coelacanths in particular were ever seen as directly ancestral to tetrapods or even representative of the morphology of the ancestors of tetrapods. This supposed status of coelacanth fins as the precursors to legs is just something that, near as I can tell, was invented by creationists as a straw man of evolution. And they said they were extinct. And on the level of nearly all the families and all the genera from the fossil record, that was correct. The only incorrect bit was that the entirety of the group was extinct. Think about it like this. We know that pterosaurs are extinct, right? And that the last ones lived at the end of the Cretaceous. Now suppose that somewhere obscure, like the northern tip of Novaya Zemlya, that there were two species of closely related small pterosaur that still existed. Does that change anything really about the extinction of all the other pterosaurs? No, it just means that one lineage managed to cling on throughout the Cenozoic until today, and they lived in out-of-the-way places that didn't result in much in the way of a fossil record. Also, it's hard to see what about the survival of such a small group of pterosaurs in the middle of nowhere would constitute a problem for evolutionary biology. Nothing in evolution demands that any given lineage go extinct at a certain point. Coelacanth, it is kind of a primal-looking fish, but you see that's the artist rendering on the right there. On the left, you see someone swimming with a coelacanth. That's because... In 1928, they found a living version of the coelacanth. Well, a dead one was found in a fish market. But yeah, it was freshly dead, indicating an extant population. So this is a fairly minor mistake. In the waters off of South Africa, they found that they're still very much alive. They just had not caught them before. In fact, they had been caught for a long time, presumably millennia. 
It's just that Western biologists hadn't known about it. This is actually pretty common. Locals in an area are usually more familiar with the flora and fauna than foreign biologists. So when a biologist discovers a new species, really they're just formally describing a species known to locals. But it's the first time that the species is entering the scientific literature. They live in very deep oceans, and they don't do very well when they bring them up. I can't seem to find anything to back up the idea that they die in shallow water, but that is something that happens to many, but not all deep sea species, so it's perfectly plausible. So you try to get them to walk, they don't like that at all. They die when you bring them up, because they're not used to the, the low pressure. And 65 million years, and they still have not gotten those feet worked out yet. Ah, you see, this is a profound misunderstanding of evolution. This objection presupposes that evolution is orthogenic, that there is some biological destiny that causes lineages to evolve in a particular direction independent of selection. A famous example of this idea is that brontotheres had this orthogenic trend to bigger and bigger head ornamentation, and that eventually it just got so big and crazy that they couldn't handle it and went extinct. Of course, we know now that evolution is not orthogenic, and there is no inexorable force reducing the digits of equids or forcing all low-finned fish to develop legs for terrestrial locomotion. There is no reason for a deep-sea fish in the coelacanth's niche to develop terrestrial legs, so there's no surprise that they didn't. But also, they weren't doing that for more than 340 million years. They do appear in the fossil record, while other animals were, you know, fully terrestrial, like dinosaurs and mammals. Evolution no more says that coelacanths must evolve legs than that they must go extinct. I mean, just so even a child could do the reasoning on this. That doesn't make sense. When they, they have all these theories. I'm not even sure what part isn't supposed to make sense about late surviving coelacanths. They haven't changed. 65 million years. They have changed, though. There are no fossil coelacanths that are morphologically identical to the modern coelacanths in genus Latimeria. Sure, they haven't changed as much in the last 66 million years as, say, the lineage leading to humans but there's also no minimum rate of morphological change in evolution. Further, evolution also occurs at the biochemical level, and there's no way to check to see if they've evolved in that way in the last 66 million years, since we don't really have access to ancient coelacanth biochemistry. In fact, no living fossil is completely identical to the ancient members of the group to which it belongs. As they say sharks. The only thing about sharks today is they're smaller. Uh, no. <laughs> First, Called it with sharks, so yay. Anyway, here's Xenocanthus, a mostly Triassic shark. Does that look like a modern shark? I don't know too many sharks with a dorsal fin that runs their whole back, a head spike, a spade-shaped caudal fin, or big splayed pectoral and pelvic fins. How about Stacanthus? I'm not aware of any modern sharks with a dorsal fin that looks like an ironing board. Are you? They used to have a shark called Megalodon. Picking Megalodon as the ancient shark to demonstrate a lack of morphological change in sharks is just cherry-picking. That shark went extinct less than 4 million years ago. In terms of shark evolution, it is a modern shark. Just one that went extinct. Bigger than any great white shark. And yeah, I've, in my drawer, I've got a megalodon tooth. They are some of the most common fossils in the world, so that's no surprise. That uh, Nathan knows what I'm talking about. Ancient petrified shark tooth. Looks just like sharks today. Well, not really. They look most like the teeth of a great white, but even ignoring the size difference, there are other differences. But even if there weren't, remember, Megalodon is basically a modern shark. This isn't some Devonian basal shark we're talking about. They were just bigger. Everything changed when the environment changed. Again, since Doug has indicated that the change corresponded to the KPG event, which I'm assuming means he thinks that that's the flood boundary, then the entire fossil record of Megalodon has to be post-flood, which means it was around after this change. So what actually changed then? Clearly not something that would uh, disallow giant sharks, since this giant shark lived after that change. And further, what about this change would be a problem for Megalodon, but not, say, a whale shark, which is an extant shark that can grow up to 10 meters in length? Megalodon is estimated to have reached a maximum length of 10.2 meters. Did those last 20 centimeters really make the difference? I don't know. Doug here hasn't even described what about the world he thinks changed aside from oxygen. But if it's not a problem for the whale shark, I don't see why current oxygen levels would be a problem for Megalodon. Hey, the horseshoe crabs, I think, is the next example I've got. Nice. Called it again. There you've got horseshoe crab on the left. You've got a fossil. They say 100 million. You know how long a million years is? Yes. It's like 31 quadrillion, 556 billion, 952 million seconds. 100 million years old. 100 million years. Why have those horseshoe crabs? Do you know you go to the... How many of you have been to the Atlantic coast and seen the horseshoe crabs that crawl up on the shore? Finish your thought before moving on, dude. Oh, we used to see them when I lived in New York City. This guy, you flip them over. They're scary looking. Oh no, the underside of a horseshoe crab has a bunch of legs and some mouth parts. 
And all these little things start grappling in the air with little claws and pincers on them. And they have not improved their appearance in a hundred million years. And yet somehow they still survive. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Is he implying that something about evolution is supposed to make animals appeal to the human sense of aesthetics? That's definitely not true. You would have thought the other creatures would have just killed them off because they're so ugly. I think this is just a joke, but this guy is so stupid I really can't tell. In case you need it said, no, animals do not get killed for being ugly as a general rule. They still, they, you know, they say, if you want to know what a primitive eye is, the eye is so complex. Then you should look at a flatworm or a nautilus. Most of what's coming into your brain is coming through your eye right now. And they've got what they call a primitive eye. How come their eyes have not gotten any better? All they can do is kind of see light and darkness. Hundred million years! Well, first, if they're doing pretty well with that, then why would they spend resources on fancy eyes? Many organisms do just fine without eyes at all. Evolution isn't a wish-fulfillment machine for humans. But further, horseshoe crabs can do more than just detect light and dark. They can detect conspecifics at a distance, which they may use to find mates. Now, they don't have great eyesight, but other than mate detection and basic predator avoidance, none of their behaviors seem to depend on sight, so there's no need for them to have great eyes. Eyes are developmentally, neurologically, and metabolically costly, and as we can see in cave-dwelling species, if you don't need them, they're a detriment to keep around. Horseshoe crabs have kept eyes that are only as good as they need them to be, just like the nautilus with its pinhole camera eyes, or the flatworm with its photosensitive bits of skin. It's just not logical to me. Well, that's the least surprising thing I've heard in a while. Doug is a willful idiot, and his incredulity over basic facts of science does nothing to argue against those facts. I think the only logical explanation is the miracle of creation. Ah, yes, because Doug doesn't understand the basics of evolution, we should just replace it with magic. I'm sure that'll fly with all the biologists out there who are spending their lives actually trying to uncover the facts about life on Earth, and who are making great strides. Some idiot from the USA finds their work confusing, and it hurts his fifis. Time to just toss out science, I guess. And it's not just biology. Young Earth creationism requires us to toss out most of science, from astronomy to chemistry to biology to geology to nuclear physics. It's hard to think of a science that wouldn't have to be basically ditched wholesale to accept Doug's ideas. It sure is a good thing that actual scientists don't give a single flying f*** about what Doug finds confusing. Now, then I want to explain, I do believe in evolution. I find that hard to believe, given that he can't even approach a reasonable understanding of it. But lest someone stop the tape right there, let me explain. I believe in what you call micro-evolution. Oh, I guess we're leaving living fossils behind. Okay, well, just for funsies, here's Lunataspis, a primitive horseshoe crab in which the hind section is still fully segmented, putting the lie to the idea that the group has not had morphological change during its history on Earth. Anyway, as for microevolution, I bet he's going to misdefine it, and that he actually believes in macroevolution under the actual definition used in evolutionary biology which is the only definition that matters when discussing evolutionary biology, which is the topic of this talk. We see examples of microevolution all around us. That's true. If you look at the person next to you, you will see examples of microevolution. No, you won't, because like all evolution, it is a phenomenon that affects a population over time, or diachronically, if you will. Just looking at individual members of a population synchronically will show you variation, but not any kind of evolution. You actually have to track the changes in a population over generations to see evolution of any kind, meaning that in a human lifespan, it's hard to see much microevolution at all in humans. Now, much of the variation in humans has arisen through microevolution, so you can see the results of it, but that's not the same thing as seeing the process itself. Microevolution is where the rabbits, the common hare that is living out in the desert, after a few generations for some reason, God has designed their DNA for survival reasons, they will develop brown fur where they can melt into their environment. I'm melting! Melting! Oh, what a world! What a world! And you will have a hair. It is still a hair. And it will be up in the Arctic, and it will have white fur so it can blend into its environment. You will see great diversity of species that have evolved within their species. That was a little muddled, but yes, microevolution is evolution within the species. I'm rather surprised he got that right, but I also worry that that means he will deny speciation. And on the picture here, I put as an example, exhibit A of what we would call microevolution is look at the incredible variety of dogs. Most, uh, think about, just think about it. Okay, I'm thinking about it and wondering if a wolf could evolve into a pug, what makes him think that humans and chimpanzees can't share a common ancestor? That's a whole heck of a lot less morphological change. Dogs. Yep, dogs. What about them? 
You know, I remember when I was growing up, we almost oh, never saw used to tell a them stories that don't go anywhere. Like the time I caught the ferry over to Shelbyville, I needed a new heel for my shoe. So I decided to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. So I tied an onion to my belt, which was the style at the time. Now, to take the ferry cost a nickel, and in those days, nickels had pictures of bumblebees on them. Give me five bees for a quarter, you'd say. Now, now I see them we? almost everywhere oh, I look. Yeah. I think the they have been, they was, been mass bred. Um, you got little what bitty dachshunds. See that poor little they dog there? It looks like a little I mouse know. next to a Coke can. And then, you know, one of the tallest dogs in the world lived up in Grass Valley. It was called Gibson. Died recently. It was a Great Dane. She took him around and we, we saw him a couple of times. Eight feet high when he stood up. Do you know they got horses that are smaller than dogs? I did know that, yes. Well, the smallest horse is bigger than the smallest dog, but the biggest dogs are bigger than the smallest horses. And then they got Clydesdales. They got dogs with no hair. Back to dogs, I guess. No more horsey time. This guy just can't stick to a topic, can he? I'm going to wait for him to get to a point. And they say that they can trace the DNA of every dog in the world back to two original dogs that were probably very wolf-like. Dogs are still genetically extremely similar to the gray wolf. In fact, they're in the same species. You notice that in the wild, the dogs like the coyotes and the wolves, they fared pretty well. Hold up. We just skipped like four minutes of talking about breeds of Canis lupus familiaris as examples of results of microevolution, which is reasonable. But now we're jumping to other species. That's macroevolution. I thought he had the right definition of microevolution. Does he just not know that there is more than one species in the family Canidae? In the original dogs, Noah did not take on the ark a dachshund and a Maltese, and a German Shepherd, and a St. Bernard, and a Beagle, and a Yapsu Apsu, and all the other dogs. He didn't take, he took two dogs. So, two dogs, two wolves, two red foxes, two fennec foxes, two coyotes, two golden jackals, two maned wolves, two doles, two painted dogs. Is that what we're going with? That is certainly interesting. It raises some serious problems for space in Noah's Ark, and is at odds with what every major and most minor creationist ministry say. Let's let him cook. And look at all the variety of people. You can show the next slide. Oh, okay. We're not going to elaborate on that. We're just going to switch to one species of primate. This talk is going to give me whiplash from all the sudden topic changes before the previous topic is even resolved. You can show the next slide. In the world that we see today, how many people did they all come from? That's a really weird question, but there's good reason to think based on paleogenomics and human genetic diversity that at a minimum, humans were reduced to tens of thousands of individuals. So I guess like 10,000 minimum. Adam and Eve, and then once again from everybody that was on the boat, on the ark. No, the idea of all human beings coming from only one pair of humans some 6,000 years ago is literally impossible, given the current diversity of Homo sapiens. We can measure the substitution rate for both the Y chromosome and mitochondria, which is how you'd go about determining this, and it's orders of magnitude too slow for humans to have originated only 6,000 years ago. Further, no part of the genome coalesces that recently, not just the non-recombining parts. This really is just a matter of measurement, and the measurement says that creationists are off by at least two orders of magnitude on this one. And look at all the variety. I could go around the world today, you know, because I've traveled quite a bit, and I can go to the different islands of Polynesia, and I can see the differences between the Fijians and the Samoans and the people from New Guinea and the Aborigines. And Hooray, Doug has unlocked the recognizing gross morphological differences in Cohen specifics achievement. It's just because of the breeding and the genes, different traits become dominant. Uh, no, dominant traits don't become dominant. They're inherently dominant because of the details of how they work biochemically. But I think what he means, but doesn't know enough to express clearly, is that different traits become fixed in regional populations, such that all members of that population have the trait as a result of them having the alleles that produce it. So I believe in microevolution. But what you do not see is something that is half dog and half cat. I mean... Except for Measis, which has the morphology predicted for the common ancestor of cats and dogs, and lived around the time such an ancestor would be expected based on molecular clocks. Damn. You do not see crossing happening be between the types. What, in modern, greatly diverged groups? Yeah, of course not. That's kind of how evolution works. Saying that evolution is fake because reproductive isolation is a real thing is kind of like saying the Bible is fake because King Darius was real. I'm sure the biblical scholars in my audience will understand that one. That doesn't happen. And the Bible says God made each one after their kind. We would say species. 
Okay, so yeah, I guess he does think that kind is at the species level and not at the family level. But the problem is that humans have observed speciation in real time. So we have seen things go from one kind to another by this definition. We have seen it in primroses, fruit flies, house flies. We're now seeing it in apple maggot flies, worms, and bacteria. Seeing it in large animals with long generation times is harder to do, but fundamentally they follow the same rules of biology as worms and flies. You'll have great diversity among the species, but the species do not cross. Even if he means contemporaneously, that's not true. Mules, tigons, ligers, and many other cross-species hybrids exist. In the fossil record, there is no evidence of the transitional forms between species. Horseshoe crabs are still horseshoe crabs. And this is what they see in the fossil record as well. Well, you know what time it is. So, there are missing links. I mean, yeah, of course not every single link in the history of evolution of all species are currently known. In order for that to happen, every single species would have to not only have been preserved as a fossil, but humans would have had to have already found every single species that has ever been preserved. We know both of these things are not true. The second is especially obvious because new fossil taxa are described nearly every day. This is like saying that you don't believe that someone's childhood photos actually show them growing up, because there isn't 24-7 video footage of them for their entire life, like they're the star of the Truman Show. Um, the, tr there are the transitional forms between the different creatures are still missing. Except when they're not. You know, you've seen the textbooks where they've got the you know, monkey walking on his knuckles, and then slowly he starts to walk a little more on his feet, and he gets more and more erect until you've got Homo erectus, and the man is standing up, and he's got the normal gait. And, and they show all these things in the illustration of the books. But, you know, the creatures, the, the fossil evidence in the transition between the monkey and the man does not exist. That's just a straight-up lie. While I do not like the March of Progress illustration, because it depicts the evolution of humans too orthogenetically, all the animals on it are known animals, and far from all the animals we have. It lists Dryopithecus, Oreopithecus, Ramopithecus, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, and modern man in the short version. But there's also Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo noledi, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, Sahelanthropus chinensis, Australopithecus animensis, Australopithecus barogazali, Australopithecus diarmida, Australopithecus garhi, and more. The March of Progress couldn't fit all of these reconstructions in one picture. You'll see in that Time magazine on the cover, you see how there's particles of bone, and then they fill a lot in with epoxy and resin. Let me give you a little um, practical input into how some of these supposed missing links are found. First of all, there is no complete skeleton of any missing link that they found. None. Zero. Yeah, complete skeletons basically don't exist in the fossil record. But combine the bilaterally symmetrical nature of apes with the fact that we have multiple specimens for most hominin species, and that there are biomechanical constraints on skeletons, and we know that the reconstructions are reasonably accurate. In fact, you can think of the reconstruction as a hypothesis, and when new finds are made that fill in what was once just inferred, they tend to more often than not confirm the reconstruction as plausible. Plus, you can't simply hand wave the transitional nature of a skeleton that is evident in the parts that scientists have actually found by complaining about what is missing. If someone finds a femur that is intermediate between a basal ape and a modern human, like the femora of Australopithecus africanus, you can't simply dismiss that by saying, ah, but what were the lacrimal bones doing, hmm? Not supposing we don't have Africanus lacrimal bones, which I don't know if we do, nor do I really care if we do or do not. It's just a bone I picked at more or less random. Don't at me. They find pieces of bone. You will have an expedition working in Africa. They are being funded by a university or some private supporter or some deep pocket, and they are digging 
looking for evidence of human evolution. And finding it. And of course that's what they're paid to do. Who would pay someone to just dig around in the rocks of Africa for fun? This is such a weird complaint. No one complains that people pay for research into new treatments for diseases because that research actually sometimes turns up new treatments. Nor is the fact that research set out to find new treatments good reason to suspect that the treatment doesn't work. Research requires the use of scarce resources, including fuel, time, chemical reagents, food, water, space on transport vehicles, etc., etc., etc. Like it or not, the most efficient ways humans have figured out to distribute such things is with prices that, while not perfect, roughly signal how valuable resources are, and if you want to use them, you generally have to pay for them. This isn't really time to talk about the tragedy of the commons, but yeah, if you want research done, someone is going to have to foot the bill. And the fact that creationists don't like the result of the research and therefore reject it is a problem with them, not the research. And if they don't produce something, their funding dries up. No, funding is usually guaranteed for the duration of the research project because grant proposals are designed to seek the funding actually required to conduct the research in most cases. So when those proposals are approved, the funding is going to last until it's up, no matter the results. Now, if an avenue of research never turns up results, then sure, new grant proposals for such research will usually be rejected. But that's also true in evolutionary biology. No one is funding research into the origins of hominins in Europe because scientists check there and it turns out they failed to find any. This again is perfectly normal and normally creations don't complain about it when the research is into something that they don't feel they need to object to. They are extremely motivated to find something. Wow, this just in. People who decided to spend their lives researching a topic are motivated to research that topic. Stay tuned for more Galaxy Brain Insights from Dougie. And so when they find any kind of ancient gorilla bone, which has never happened, despite people looking for them. Orangutan bone. Actually, a fair few orangutan relatives are known in the fossil record and are described as such in the literature. They will get epoxy in an artist. They become very creative and they say, well, you know, there's a little difference here in the skull shape. We think this was a transition. And they start to put it together and they hire an artist and they draw pictures about what Mr. Mr. Lucy and Mrs. Lucy and all the little Lucys look like and... Clearly, this is a man who never actually read a paleontology paper, because while they do hire artists to make reconstructions, the conclusions they reach are always based strictly on what bone is actually there. The reconstructions are just a nice add-on, but the meat of the paper is all the photographs and sketches of the actual fossil material, less any reconstructed bits between them. That's also why our definitions of first species in the fossil record are based on the features that can be actually measured in the fossils themselves. It's pretty rich for the guy who has gotten basically everything factually incorrect for the past hour or so of this talk to accuse scientists of basing new species on their own artistic work and not the data. I, I gotta be very careful about how I say this, but... Odd. He generally has not shown a tendency to be careful in what he says. It seems more like this has been a long stream of consciousness in which whatever seemed true because of his intuition and previous religious conclusions is just assumed to be true. I mean, this man said that there were no ferns in Siberia, yet if you Google Siberia fern, a species of fern native to Siberia, Alaska, and northern Canada is literally the first thing that pops up. If you look around in the world today, you're going to find, even in this room, people with all different shaped skulls. Now, don't look. <laughs> Could make someone feel self-conscious. Cool. Find me a modern human skull as prognathic as that of Australopithecus afarensis or with the occipital bun of Homo neanderthalensis, or even who just doesn't have a chin, like all non-H sapien species of hominins. You won't. That's because the fossil hominins are outside the range of morphological variation in Homo sapiens overall, even if there is some overlap in some characteristics. To pull from an earlier example of this, this is like saying that horses and dogs are really the same animal, because they overlap in size. It's ludicrous. Some people, we got different foreheads and different eyebrows and different sizes, and some people are tall and some people are short. And that does not mean when they find one of these, even among gorillas, they find incredible diversity among the skull shapes. Hey, Doug, if you ever watch this, I want you to know that you're allowed to finish your sentences. In fact, it's encouraged. And even among humans, they patch it together. They call it what they want. They say, we found the missing link. They haven't. We have complete skeletons of dinosaurs. We absolutely f do not. The most complete dinosaur fossil I can find evidence for is a specimen of Triceratops called Hordus the Triceratops, which is housed in the Melbourne Museum and is about 85% complete. Most dinosaur finds are fragmentary, with a few long bones, maybe a few vertebral centra, a few ribs, things like that. I routinely see dinosaur paleontology papers describing a handful of bones. 
it must be so easy to be a creationist. You can just make up any old bullshit, and as long as it sounds like it supports the dumbest version of Christianity, people will just lap it up like a dog drinking water on a hot Arizona afternoon. Within a certain species, many of the dinosaurs, complete skeletons. By many, he means none. There is no complete skeleton. If, if man has been around for the millions of years that they tell us, then how come we can't find one complete skeleton? We just find these little pieces and a lot of imagination, and they create it. Um, because complete skeletons basically don't exist in the fossil record. But again, conclusions about fossil taxa aren't drawn from reconstructions. And further, the most complete hominin fossil is Littlefoot, or STW-573, which is about 90% complete you might notice that that's more complete than the most complete dinosaur. So this supposed paradox doesn't exist. The hominin fossil record is better preserved than any family of dinosaurs. We're just still making things up out of thin air. It's just not there, friends. Um, and by the way, just because they find bones in a cave doesn't mean that cavemen lived millions of years ago. You're looking at someone who lived in a cave, and here we are in the 21st century, right? So... Well, first, most hominin fossils aren't found in caves, but those that are are dated using objective methods, such as radiometric dating. They aren't just assumed to be some age based on the whim of researchers. For example, Australopithecus sediba, which was found in a cave, was dated by both paleomagnetism and uranium-led dating, and both independent methods return an age of approximately 2 million years. Just because they find doesn't mean everyone... There were people living in caves the same time they had people building pyramids. There are people living in caves right now. Everyone knows this, and it's not an argument for or against anything, because no one is assuming the age of a fossil based on the bare fact that it was found in a cave. Doesn't mean one evolved from the other. There are people that live in very sophisticated cities today, and there are people who live in caves today. Yeah, and does Doug think that this fact is lost on paleoanthropologists? I assure you, they're aware of this. But I think he's just going to ignore actual dating methods, because if he acknowledged them, that might bring up some unwelcome nuance. Same time, in history. Yup. Well, some say, well, because there's similarity among species, and there are certain similarities among species, that means that they all evolve from a common source. This man has never heard of a Segway. I've just put a picture up here on the screen. You've got a, uh, a Corvette. A Corvette, and a bunch of other things that don't reproduce with variation. So we're not going to bother. I'm simply skipping the dumb analogy, because if I had to point out in detail why comparing the features of living things, which we've never seen designed and which reproduce with imperfect heritability, to non-living, non-reproducing man-made objects which we have seen designed again, I'm going to claw my own eyes out. Why do you find similarities between people and monkeys and dogs and cats? There are certain things they have in common, no question about that. Well, it depends. In many cases, it's because of the constraints of the environment. For example, humans and chimpanzees are both tool-using and tool-creating omnivorous diurnal apes that live in social groups. As a result, yeah, some of the similarities can be seen as probably being the result of physical necessity. Similarly, dolphins and sharks have a similar body shape because both need to swim fast, and having a fusiform body is the best way to do that. It's also why the same basic shape occurred in ichthyosaurs. On the other hand, there are similarities that are not explained that way. For example, why would all monkeys, humans included, have the same breakage in their gulo pseudogene? Even if none of them typically need to synthesize their own vitamin C, there's no reason other than common descent for all of them to have a gene that would allow them to do so, be broken in all of them in the same way every time. Similarly, they all have the remnants of ancient viruses in their genomes. This is what are called endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs. Surely, nothing about the environment dictates that humans and chimpanzees must of necessity have been infected in both species past by the exact same virus in the exact same place in their respective genomes. Further, there's no good reason their genome should be so correlatable in the first place. There's nothing special about the architecture of either the chimpanzee or the human genome. Yet every single chimpanzee chromosome maps directly onto a corresponding chromosome in the human genome, except that two chimpanzee chromosomes directly map onto one human chromosome in one instance. And in that one instance, the human chromosome has the clear and unmistakable hallmarks of having fused from two chromosomes that would have each mapped directly onto one of the two chimp chromosomes. None of this can be explained by similar needs imposed externally, and they only make sense in the context of common ancestry. Sure, you could say that maybe God just made it that way to trick us, but I don't think Doug is going to say that, so I won't address it here. If he does make such a silly claim, don't worry, I'll talk about it. Because they were made by the same God. We said, I think I'll make one with a little difference this way. And, you know, I'd like to add this. This creature, I'll make it different, but some similarities I like. I'm going to add that and this and make this. And Then when we see different designs, can we infer different designers? For instance, did a different God make the bat wing, the bird wing, and the pterosaur wing? 
I mean, they're all doing the same basic thing, generating lift and thrust, and they're all even four limbs. Why are they so radically different in a way that makes sense in terms of evolutionary contingency, but that doesn't make any sense in terms of common design? What's the reason God could not simply have given all flying tetrapods a standard wing? It's because evolution is true, that's why. And they all live in the same environment. We need systems to propel ourselves, so we all got legs or fins or wings. You know, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that he can look at vastly different fins of a whale and a carp and think that's common design, when the internal structure is almost completely different. Flying fish? Which actually don't fly, but instead glide, and have their wings designed in yet a fourth way that matches none of the other wings in nature. So I guess now we need to add yet another designer. And here I thought Christians considered themselves monotheists. God made fish that kept jumping out of the water so long that after millions of years they developed aerodynamic design? Fins are automatically at least a bit aerodynamic because the difference between aerodynamics and hydrodynamics isn't really all that great. Air is basically just a much less dense medium, and the basic principles of drag, lift, thrust, and gravity all still operate in both media. Further, flying fish use their gliding ability to avoid waterbound predators like sharks. And so if leaping becomes the main predator evasion strategy of a species of fish, they are under strong natural selection pressure to improve the lift already provided by their fins. And this explains why they have what are essentially wings, but wings unlike any other wings, which is not what you might expect from a designer who can simply bolt on previous designs, like a pterosaur wing, onto a fish. If special creation were true, we should see chimeras. We do not, therefore the hypothesis is probably not true. No, oh, I'm being facetious, please. Of course he's being facetious, the one time that he makes the most sense. That checks out. But the idea that there are fish that fly? Which, strictly speaking, is a false idea. There are... They don't really fly, they glide. They don't flap. That's true. But they glide a long way, I've seen them. They're squirrels! That also glide, and use what creationists might call half a wing to do so. So if he at some point asks what good is half a wing, I'll be referring back to this. That fly? Again, no. Why do some fly and others don't? Contingency. Some squirrel species had mutations that increased their aerodynamic ability, and it was advantageous. Some didn't. The ones that didn't, don't glide. The ones that did, do. We can see this contingency in evolution in the Lenski long-term evolution experiment. In this experiment, Escherichia coli bacteria were put into a solution of water, sodium citrate, glucose, and a few other things, like thiamine and ammonium sulfate. We're really only concerned with the glucose and the sodium citrate right now. Glucose was intended to be the primary source of calories for the experiment. One of the primary characteristics of E. coli is that they cannot metabolize sodium citrate in the presence of oxygen, that is, in an aerobic environment. The citrate in the flask the bacteria are grown in contains 0.417 calories, the glucose contains only 0.0005 calories. This is based on a calorie density of 1.67 calories per gram of sodium citrate and 4 calories per gram of glucose, and that the former is included at 1 quarter of a gram and that the latter is included at 125 micrograms, which is the standard amounts in the DM25 growth medium used in the 500 milliliter flasks in the Lenski long-term experiment. Clearly, if the bacteria could access this, it would be a huge boost to their fitness, but only one line of bacteria have developed the ability to exploit this resource. Why is that? Well, it required a series of mutations, each of which is unlikely on their own, and all of which occur stochastically, so only one lineage was lucky enough to get the right mutations. It's possible some other lineage might develop this ability later, but it's been thousands of generations, and so far, only one has. That means that such amazing feats of evolution are possible, but not guaranteed in any lineage. Similarly, contingency means that some squirrels will develop gliding abilities, and others won't. Evolution has both random and non-random aspects. Normally, creationists like to ignore the non-random aspects so that they can use an argument from incredulity about how they don't think randomness could create the world around us all on its own, which is also a straw man argument in addition to being an argument from incredulity. So that's a fun double fallacy. Doug Batchelor here is instead ignoring the random parts and expecting evolution to be 100% predictable with all members of a group evolving in the same way as if there were no contingency in evolution. Remember, evolution has both stochastic and deterministic factors. And ignoring either means you will misunderstand it. There are snakes in Indonesia that jump from trees and they can flatten the rib cage and glide. Yep, it's pretty cool. They got frogs that will spread out their toes and fly. Well, like the snakes, it's gliding and it's Wallace's flying frog, a species I've mentioned here on the channel before. I'm glad he knows so many examples of half wings. Other creations should take note. But what's really amazing to me is the birds that fly. Well, unlike the previous examples, they do in fact fly. Now, you've heard me say many times, I'm a pilot. I don't remember that, but, um, okay. 
So I don't know everything, but I know a little bit about aerodynamic design and what's required in order to achieve and to maintain. It's important to maintain flight when you're pilot and what's needed for that. The idea that lizards could just keep running off cliffs and somehow, before they crashed on the bottom, develop something aerodynamic and hollow bones and feathers and pass that on to their offspring. You can give me billions of years, and I just can't see any scenario where that would happen. I also can't believe that. Unfortunately, that's not what anyone believes. So here he stepped a bit into my arena. So let's do this. First, birds are indeed reptiles, but they are certainly not lizards. Lizards are one group of lepidosaurs, a group that includes ichthyosaurs, spinodonts, lizards, and amphisbanians. Now, it's not clear if amphisbanians are lizards or not, and they are poorly studied. So if later it comes out definitively that they are lizards, I don't want to hear that I was wrong to list them separately, because I'm making the caveat now. On the other hand, birds, being dinosaurs, are archosaurs, a group that includes crocodilians, adosaurs, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs. Living archosaurs are basically only crocodilians and birds, and living lepidosaurs are basically only sphenodonts, lizards, and amphisbanians. Within archosauria, there are two big groups, Pseudosuchia and Ornithodira. Crocodilians are in the Pseudosuchia group, and dinosaurs and pterosaurs are ornithodirans. Ornithodirans are characterized by an upright stance with acetabula or hip sockets that face out to the side, superficially similar to the way mammals carry their limbs. Now, for numerous reasons, birds are within dinosauria, but we'll list some of the major factors that define dinosaurs that are present in birds. First and foremost is the open acetabulum, which is to say that rather than a cup, their hip sockets are a ring of bone with an opening you can see right through. Interestingly enough, creationists like to lie about this fact whenever they discuss the bird-dinosaur connection. Second is that birds have three or more sacral vertebrae, often far more. Third is that these vertebrae are firmly attached to the hip. Fourth is that their fourth trochanter, the femur, is asymmetrical, and just having such a trochanter is itself a diagnostic trait of archosaurs. There are others, but those are sufficient to establish birds as dinosaurs, and I don't really want to get too far into the weeds. Now, feathers are actually something that evolved early on in dinosaur evolution. It's possible that even the furry covering of pterosaurs is homologous to the early dinophos protofeathers that can be seen in some dinosaurs. Anyway, the development from scale to feather is just a change in the expression of the same genes that make scales, and scales, feathers, and mammal hair are all developed from the same embryonic structure, i.e. placodes. In fact, alligator embryos can be induced to develop filaments instead of scales. Now, the flapping motion of bird wings is essentially the same as the prey capture motion allowed by the arms of their closest non-avian dinosaurs, the Manoraptorans. So rather than lizards jumping off cliffs, it's more like this. First, you have relatively primitive amnios that are superficially lizard-like in their stance. Then you get more upright and more bipedal animals like Euparcaria at the base of Archosauria. Then we get ornithodirons like Lagosuchus that are on their way to being dinosaurs. Then we get to basal dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus. Then we get to basal tetanurin theropods like Allosaurus. Here we're getting a bit bird-like. These are animals with a furcula, the wishbone that you might remember from carving a roasted bird. Let's skip to Manoraptora where we get to the semi-lunate carpal that allows birds to fold their wings in animals like Anzu. Then we get to animals like Anchiornis, which is almost a bird with the ability to glide on four wings and that was apparently living in trees, meaning that just like with many gliding animals today, such as flying squirrels, flying snakes, and flying frogs, this gliding was used to travel safely from tree to tree or from tree to ground and to avoid predators in the trees. Then we can look at Archaeopteryx, which is just bird-like enough that most people call it a bird even though it has teeth, no beak, a long bony tail, and unfused wing fingers, unfused metacarpals, and no keel on its sternum. That's where I'll leave it for now, as I've gone into even more detail many times on this channel, and please note that I have skipped dozens of named clades and scores of species that are significant to the story of the evolution of birds. So we go from quadruped to biped to having feathers to climbing to gliding to flying. None of this is well summarized as lizards leaping off of cliffs. The Bible says the Lord made the fish, and he made the birds. And he made, he actually kind of made creatures in order of their importance and complexity, making first of the environment, then he made the vegetation, and then he made, oh, people say, Pastor Doug. For the third time now, Doug, you were allowed to finish your sentences before moving on to new ones. In fact, it is still encouraged. God didn't even make the sun till the fourth day. That's one reason I don't believe in this long scheme where each of the days of creation were actually long epochs of thousands or millions of years. God makes the vegetation on the third day, and he doesn't make the sun until the fourth day. Well, Pastor Doug, how do you have God saying, let there be light, if he didn't make the sun? Way to figure out one of the big problems with day-age old earth creationism. I don't care about that, so I'm skipping until he's done complaining about different flavors of creationism. Gets to day four, and he makes... Our galaxy, I believe, with the sun, the moon, and the stars. I believe there are many other galaxies that pre-existed our world. I believe there's life on other planets and other parts of the unfallen universe. See, this is technically something I said I would skip, but it's really interesting. 
Most Christians do not think of the fall as limited to just one area around Earth, and instead see the whole cosmos as fallen. You can see this in C.S. Lewis' space opera trilogy that starts with Paralandra. In this, humans visit various planets in the solar system, including Venus and Mars, to find aliens familiar with the basic outlines of the Western Christian take on the Christian religion, and who seem to believe in the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. They too must deal with sin and have a need for a savior like humans, and apparently they adopt Jesus as the savior. If we turn to Eastern Christianity, we can see a lot of the conception of the universe in the Pentecost icon common in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which depicts a figure at the bottom that is a personification of the cosmos. In fact, in icons in which the people depicted are labeled, this figure is labeled as cosmos. He is usually depicted as a sad king, sad because of the fallen nature of all reality, and a king because the cosmos retains the dignity that God gave it when he created the world. His hope is represented in the cloth he holds, carrying the twelve scrolls representing the teaching of the twelve apostles who spread Christianity. If we turn to the Bible in Romans 8.22, we read, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The idea that only part of the universe has fallen is very unusual in Christianity, to the point that I think Mr. Bachelor here is the first Christian I've ever heard advocate for it. It's strange to me the degree to which Dougie here takes opposite stances from other creationists while still falling under the broad umbrella of young earth creationism. I wonder what the likes of Ken Ham and Randy Galuza would think of him. As a side note, the Christian understanding of the fall, the effect of the sin of Adam on humanity, and the cosmos, and the nature of salvation is in fact quite diverse. Don't let evangelicals fool you into thinking that their ideas about it are just the default Christian position. I'm skipping ahead a bit until the next point that isn't just him explaining the basic order of creation as set down in Genesis, along with a harmonization of the contradictory accounts of Genesis 1 and 2. And so... God does all this as the crowning act of his creation, makes man in his image. That gives you some purpose in life, that you come from God and we will, God himself will live with us. But you see, Doug, God isn't a scientific explanation, even if it's true. Science is about how the natural world operates in the absence of miracles. So simply saying that doesn't actually mean that science is about to stop checking in on those things, even if it's true that God created life or humans or whatever. We're going to go back to God. So don't be deceived by some of that uh, confusion. Yeah, there's similarities. And then there's the dating dilemma. This is so important. I've only got a few moments to talk about it. Oh, good. We're going to hear things that are wrong about radiometric dating. I can't say I'm surprised. Um, The whole evolutionary scheme rises or falls on the dating. Eh, I'll allow it. Since we cannot observe any spontaneous life happening, we cannot produce any spontaneous life happening anywhere in our world. Which doesn't matter since evolution is something that happens only once you already have life. If it could be demonstrated that life popped into existence after being created ex nihilo by the Christian God, that would do nothing to evolutionary biology at all. This is one of those things like late surviving non-avian dinosaurs. Even if it's true, it doesn't really help young earth creationism, although I suppose it would help theism, which late surviving dinosaurs would not do. In order for it to happen, the way that that's achieved is just say, we got millions of years. Uh, No, there's a whole interdisciplinary field called Origins of Life Research that in no way is simply relying on lots of time and then hand-waving everything else. They're conducting actual experiments in chemistry to see what possibilities there are for the origin of life. Now, there are ways off from actually having a working hypothesis, but they are certainly making progress, and they now have plausible abiotic ways to get basically all the important building blocks needed for life to come into existence. Millions of years have gone by, but the dating methods they use, carbon-14 dating, radioisotope dating, they're all assuming that the environment is the same today as it was 6,000 years ago. And the Bible says it was radically different. Uh, no. Carbon dating literally has calibration curves, specifically because we know the conditions of the natural world are not constant. This is explained in literally the first result from Google for radiocarbon calibration, which is an article from Oxford University about how things like tree rings are used to help calibrate carbon dating curves, specifically because solar radiation varies over time, leading to more or less production of carbon-14. Let me read something to you from Compton's Encyclopedia. N14, or carbon-14, interacts with cosmic rays. Scientists believe that cosmic rays have been bombarding the atmosphere ever since the Earth was formed. They're believing it's constant. Well, if Doug has a way to stop the stars, the sun included, from shining, which is what it would take to stop cosmic rays, then sure. But no, it's not believed to be constant. Hence why we have calibration curves. While the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere has remained constant, they're assuming that. They don't know. No, that's not an assumption either. It's something that's checked. We have samples of paleoatmosphere in things like bubbles and amber and ice. 
And further, we know that there are no globally significant sources or sinks of nitrogen. So this is both theoretically well established as well as directly measured. You'll notice that he doesn't seem to have a problem with us knowing that there was more or less oxygen at various times in Earth's past. But when it comes to nitrogen, oh no, that's too much. We can't figure that out. Okay, sure thing, Doug. Consequently, C14 or carbon-14 formation is thought to occur at a constant rate. It's not, though, except over small timescales, like centuries. Although the current ratio of C14 to other carbon atoms in the atmosphere is known, scientists are not certain that this ratio has been constant. I don't know how old that book is, but I'm pretty darn certain that it has not been, hence the calibration curves. Errors in radiocarbon dating can be caused by inaccurate radiation or particle counts, contamination of a sample with more modern carbon and stray radiation striking the counter. Using relative dating methods, scientists are able to distinguish which events occurred, but they're not always able to establish exactly when they occurred. Yep, like all measurement methods in science, there are errors and no limitations. But let's look at other things in science. According to the Susan G. Komen Foundation, there is about a 7% chance in any given mammogram that a false positive will be recorded. This is a known problem with mammograms and is why we use other methods to confirm a breast cancer diagnosis. So should we just toss out mammograms because sometimes they say that someone who doesn't have cancer does have it? I would argue no, and point to the huge number of people whose lives have been saved by mammograms, and that I think most people would rather themselves or their loved ones have a scare or even an unnecessary treatment than just, you know, die. I think you can see why occasional false readings and limitations are not a good reason to simply abandon a measurement technique. You know how most of the dating, the ancient dating, is achieved? The ancients didn't do that much dating. I think it was mostly arranged marriages. You gotta listen carefully. They find a fossil within a certain strata at a certain depth in the Earth. Strata do not map directly to depth underground or height above sea level or something. This is like middle school Earth science he's getting wrong here. And they say, because it was found at this depth, it must be this many thousands of years old. Nope. Strata are dated both relatively and absolutely. Relative dating just says X came before Y and after Z. Absolute dating actually gives numbers and units of time, like 5 million years ago, plus or minus 200,000 years. Relative dating relies heavily on the law of superposition. that says that in an undisturbed sedimentary sequence, the higher a stratum is, the younger it is, since you can't deposit new sediment under the ground. If the sequence has been disturbed, then you have to first determine which direction was up in that sequence before it was folded or tilted or what have you. Absolute dating usually cannot be done on sedimentary sequences, but instead relies on igneous rocks. That is a rock that came from a volcano. If the rock is extrusive, that is it formed on the surface, then it too is subject to the law of superposition and can be used to bracket the absolute date of sedimentary layers. For example, if you have a sedimentary stratum between an igneous rock that is 200 million years old and another one higher up that is 190 million years old, then you know the sediment was laid down sometime between 190 and 200 million years ago. Notice how at no time is a simple depth used to calculate this. Now, once this relative dating is well established with consistent sequences of sediment, index fossils can be used in the field as a quick way to determine the likely relative ages of rocks in the question in the areas that have not been so thoroughly surveyed. Usually, index fossils do not have the final word on the age of rocks, as that would be a bit circular. Well, how do you know that that depth is that many millions or thousands of years old because of the fossils we found there? No, because of the relative and absolute dating methods used to calculate that age. Index fossils are just a handy reference that are useful as a rough guide in the field. These are very ancient fossils, and we found them at that depth. That depth must represent a very long time ago. Well, how do you know that that depth is so ancient? It's still relative dating via the law of superposition and radiometric dating for absolute ages. Because of the fossils we found there. Saying a lie more than once doesn't make it true. And how do you know those fossils are so old? Because of how deep we found them. Saying a lie more than once doesn't make it true. That's what you call circular reasoning. That would indeed be circular, and it's why that's not how rocks are dated in real life. Just in the cartoon version of science that some creationists carry around in their heads. It all depends on, is the radiocarbon-14 dating accurate? No, in fact, carbon dating is not used on rocks. It can only be used on once living matter. It can't even be used on permineralized fossils. Instead, things like uranium, lead, argon, argon, and potassium argon dating are used, which do not have the same problem with production rates as does carbon-14, because they do not depend on a certain starting ratio of radioactive nuclides to non-radioactive nuclides of the same element that depends on atmospheric conditions. Instead, they rely on relative ratios of daughter to parent that are based on chemistry the same chemistry that lets people make plastic or designer drugs, and that relies on nuclear physics, the same physics that lets people make nuclear reactors and atomic bombs. Basically, unless most of physics is just flat wrong, these methods are valid. 
and they also cross-confirm each other routinely. Granted, there are anomalies, just like with mammograms, but just like with those, that's not sufficient to simply disregard them, especially when there are no observable anomalies, which is most of the time. They can only assume it's accurate based on what they test in the modern environment. No, in fact, its accuracy is routinely tested in oil exploration, where basin modeling is used to predict where to dig a new oil well. This is important because most oil companies are only a handful of dry wells away from complete bankruptcy, but also need new wells in order to keep themselves going. So how do they know where to dig? Well, as I said, basin modeling in which the age of rocks is a key aspect. Without that knowledge, digging for oil would basically be a crapshoot. And like in crafts, you usually lose. Dating in these contexts is done just like it is in paleontology. First index fossils can give a rough guide to the age of the rocks in question, but once a promising location is located, in part through the use of index fossils, actual detailed analysis begins with both relative and absolute dating. If these things did not work, oil would not be reliably found via basin modeling. Yet it is. The existence of the petrochemical industry as it is now is prima facie evidence against young earth creationism. I got a candle on the screen there. Let me explain. Oh good, a Kenthoven classic. You walk into a room, you see a candle burning, you shut the door, and I say, how long was that candle burning? You'll say, well, uh, let me measure how quickly I see it burn, and that might give me some idea about how long the candle was burning. But I say, no, wait a second. You don't know how tall it was when it started. Well then, I'll look at how much dried wax has dripped from the candle and measure any taper the candle has. Combined with a burn rate, that will give me a plausible range for how long the candle could have been burned for. If the wax has been removed, then I know my necessary conditions for estimating total elapsed burn time have been violated. But that's something I can check for. So even though this example is specifically used to exaggerate how hard it is to assess starting conditions, it has actually failed at that. Furthermore, you don't know if it's burning at the same rate now as it was before you walked in the room. When you walked in the room, you may have changed how much oxygen was in the room. That's extremely unlikely, unless there's a very strange ventilation setup, which, you know, I could check for. There's so many variables that make it very difficult for you to know with a certainty how quickly that candle has been burning. That's a big part of the reason that all measurements have a margin of error. But if after taking all the variables into account, I come up with an answer of 20 minutes plus or minus 5 minutes, and you come by and tell me it's actually 1.6 milliseconds, which is the usual factor of difference between the measured age of the Earth and the young Earth creationist claims about the age of the Earth, I know for a fact you're full of <laughs> And that's how it is with the Earth and creationism. There are certainly confounding factors in determining the age of things like rocks or the planet itself. But none of them allow for an error with a factor as great as 750,000, which is roughly what's needed for young Earth creationist claims to be plausible. That's the problem that they've got with the dating methods. A surmountable problem that leaves error margins, but still precludes young Earth creationism. Yep, I'll agree with that. Next slide, I want to show you something. A few years ago, they found a Tyrannosaurus rex thigh bone in Montana, and in the paleontologist in the laboratory, they cut with a very fine saw a cross-section, stuck it under a microscope, and they gasped. Well, first, the story is wrong. There was a days-long acid soak involved. Because here's the thing. This soft tissue isn't soft when it's dug up, and even calling it tissue is a stretch. The acid bath was intended to remove the matrix, that is, the rock surrounding the fossils, and it was only supposed to last a few hours. Instead, samples were forgotten about for quite a while, and so after all that time, what was left was indeed soft and stretchy, but it wasn't before the acid. Now, I'm sure he's going to get more wrong, so let's see what happens. When they saw in this thigh bone, ostensibly 65 million years old. And eh, more like 68 million years, but what's a few million years between friends? Red blood cells and soft tissue. Nope, structure is morphologically consistent with red blood cells, but that identification has not been confirmed to my knowledge. Further, this soft tissue is not the original structures. It is the remains of chemically altered tissues and proteins. It's analogous to the permineralization of the bone. When it's done, what you have is a rock in the shape of a bone, but not really the bone itself. This preservation was more direct, many of the atoms were the original ones, and many of the chemical bonds were as well. But many bonds have also been broken, some atoms lost, and others, especially iron, were introduced. These were molecular fossils, not the exact original chemistry of a living animal. They pulled a particle of the tissue apart, and this has not been produced by creationists, this is produced by the paleontologists. The lead paleontologist on this, one Dr. Mary Schweitzer, is in fact a former young earth creationist and a current Protestant Christian. They like to gloss over that fact. I don't. And they saw it was elastic. It still had resilience to it because it was so deep in a very large bone, it had not fully petrified. Nothing I can find in the paper by Schweitzer at all indicates that the femur of B. rex, the individual in question, was not fully permineralized. But then again, it doesn't say it was. So this is one of those things that might be true, but I don't think Doug could defend it. 
Then they started to dream about Jurassic Park. Could they extract DNA and start and inject it with a, an alligator or something to make a new modern dinosaur? They got very excited about that. I have literally never heard this claim, even from other creationists, never mind from anyone actually working on this find. But then they realized, wow, we got a problem. We've been saying these creatures were extinct 65 million years ago. 66 million, but yeah, it was surprising that molecular fossils had been preserved for so long. Not because the dates were wrong, though. The scientists were presented with two basic possibilities. Maybe there is a new preservation mechanism that they don't know about, or all of nuclear physics, geology, astronomy, and biology was wrong, which is what it would take to fit this find into a young Earth creationist timeline. Unsurprisingly, they investigated the former option first, and did so successfully, finding that iron cross-linking could preserve collagen and other protein decay products indefinitely and also that some of what they found was simply extremely stable and unlikely to have decayed, such as heme decay derived porphyrins. You go to your refrigerator after a million years. In this case, I'll assume that it's encased in sediment, full of dissolved iron, and in a largely anoxic underground kind of place. And you see how elastic things are. After like a two-month soak in acid, which happened in some cases in Schweitzer's research, I'm sure I could pull out some microscopic elastic bits, especially with all that iron and sediment and whatnot that I added to the thought experiment so that it's a reasonable analogy. Just a fridge on the surface of the planet probably wouldn't result in a fossil at all, so the whole thing is invalid the way Doug is framing it. That's why I refuse to play along with his straw man. This is not a good faith argument. You go to him after 10 million years. Do you know how long 65 million years is? I hope to find out someday. It's weird to me to ask someone if they know how long a time is when the time you give them has a unit of time on it. Like if I said, do you know how long the wait at the DMV is? That would make sense. But if I ask how long is 50 years, the only answer is 50 years. That doesn't change when the number gets bigger. It is fantasy science. Well, I for one, I'm really looking forward to Doug's correction paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, which I'm sure is coming just any day now. Because again, Unless he's got something to back him up on this, which if he did, he could publish. This is just incredulity. And all that shows is that Doug is either not interested in understanding the subject or is incapable of doing so. But what it doesn't mean is that anything is wrong with the science. To believe that these things have gone that long. And you know why? Why would some monkeys stop as monkeys? Whiplash topic change again. I should bill Doug if I need physical therapy for my strained neck muscles and bruised cervical discs. Anyway... No monkey ever stopped being a monkey, if by monkey we mean a population of monkeys and not individuals. I'll assume that's what we mean, as it's being charitable, and I don't really think he means individual monkeys. If there's this somehow natural driving force to make creatures more intelligent and more sophisticated... Which there categorically is not. Selection is context-dependent, and being simpler and dumber can be favored just as being more complex and smarter. Why did some stop? As horseshoe crabs... I don't even understand this question. Horseshoe crabs are nowhere near the lineage leading to humans. The last common ancestor between horseshoe crabs and humans was probably little more than a tube with some muscles and maybe some photosensitive skin and maybe some bristles. It may not have even had a front end. I, for one, think it did not. But further, you can't just escape your taxonomy because it's based on ancestor-descendant relationships. In order for that to happen, your descendants would have to be able to remove you as their ancestor. And that's just not how it works. Loath as I normally am to bring up the man who became Chancellor of Germany on January 30th, 1933, the reason he doesn't have any descendants or even close relatives still living isn't because he was yeeted out of the family tree. It's because his relatives opted not to reproduce to kill anything that could reasonably be called his bloodline. That's the only way to get rid of an ancestor, to not have descendants anymore. But if you have descendants, then you're their ancestor, no matter how far into the future we go. Similarly, once a clade of organisms, that is, all the organisms with a shared common ancestor of that organism, is established, unless it goes extinct, it will always be around. And while new clades can develop within it, those clades will always be members of all earlier clades to which their ancestors belonged. Having horseshoe crabs stop being horseshoe crabs is logically impossible, and they remain as they are because they're good at making babies that then make babies that then make babies. That's all evolution really cares about. And even then, it doesn't really care because evolution isn't a person with motives. It's just a biological process that operates on the scale of populations. Why were they content to stay there? Why did some go into mammals and birds and, and turn into humans? Because species split and adapt to new niches and the environment changes. Also because mutations are stochastic and already separate lineages won't have the same mutations to work with for that reason. So they diverge morphologically, biochemically, and genetically. This is high school level evolutionary biology. Anyone who asks this question is in no position to criticize evolution 
because he simply doesn't know enough about what it is to even begin to formulate a valid critique. It's like someone who thinks they'll criticize Christianity by pointing to that one time Muhammad tortured a man to find his Jew gold, then killed him. Sure, that does seem pretty bad, but, um, you know, it's not part of Christianity. Yeah, sure, it does seem like if there were some metaphysical push to make everything like humans, that it sure would be odd how many non-human animals there are, but that idea just isn't part of evolutionary biology. Why do humans have 10%, only use about 10% of their brain in their life? They don't. They use essentially all of it. This is a cliche that has been known to be bullshit for decades. Why would we develop 80% we don't use? You didn't. Maybe we were meant to live longer. Maybe, but you sure can't argue that on the basis of the stupid and very wrong claim that humans don't use most of their brains. Why do fish live longer than us? There's a certain pike, a bowhead whale, can live 200 years. Whales are mammals. They're only fish in the strict cladistic sense that they're lobe-fin fish, as are humans and all other tetrapods. But lifespans vary and are evolvable. If your best reproductive strategy is to have a huge number of offspring, then die like an octopus, then that's what selection will tend to produce. But if you're a mammal, it's often better to invest in each child more, to give it a better individual chance, and then live long enough to have a fair few kids. That's what most large mammals, like humans, whales, and elephants, and horses do. Can you imagine that? Yes, unlike Doug, apparently, I actually have a functioning imagination. It's not fair. Life's not fair, Cupcake. Cry about it if you like, but that won't fix it. There, it just does not make sense, friends. Fortunately for all of humanity, the litmus test for truth isn't just whatever still makes sense to the febrile mind of Doug Batchelor. If you want to know how old things are to do real science, you know how good scientists would measure, they would develop their theory, then they would go back 65 million years and say, sure enough, this is when it started. We have no way to go back in time and test the theory of timing that far back. Yes, literally the only way you can possibly know anything about the past in science is literal time travel. But how do we actually confirm this kind of thing? Well, one way is by checking predictions for molecular clocks against the ages of predicted transitional fossils that have been found, which themselves are cross-confirmed by multiple radiometric dating techniques. So, you know, checking multiple independent clocks. And when they all agree, it's either because we're right about the past, or because God is just a liar. And so, it is nothing but a theory. Theory is the highest level an idea in science can achieve. It's beyond law. It's beyond hypothesis. Other things that are nothing but a theory include the heliocentric model of the solar system, the germ theory of disease, and the oxygen theory of fire. I don't think Doug would like to say that he's not so sure about the fire triangle just because oxygen theory is just a theory. You're mocked if you're telling people that it's still a theory? No, you're not, because of course it's still a theory. That's kind of the end point. You're mocked for not knowing what a theory is. Those are very different things. They're, you're being told it's a fact because they're trying to remove God from the equation. Yep, all those evil atheists like Charles Lyell, Theodosius Dobzhansky, Mary Schweitzer, and Robert Bakker are scheming to get rid of God. Oh, wait, what's that? They all either are or were Christians? One of them is even a pastor? Oh, shoot, I guess that was just a straw man from Doug then, wasn't it? They're trying to get God out of the, um, the reality of uh, things existing. That sure was a string of words there. Let me give you one more, just a couple more thoughts here. I know I've gone a little over, but uh, I hope you don't mind. I kind of do, but whatever. Let's hear it, as long as it's not just preaching. One of the things they say, I'll tell you two more things. Light. When light comes from the sun, light travels 186,000 miles per second. Evolutionists will argue, they'll say, the light that we're looking at from the stars did not even leave the stars until millions of years ago. How can you say that it's only 6,000 years old? They forget the belly button effect. Ah, just jumping right into omphalism. Okay, so that's the idea that the universe isn't as old as it appears because God created it with an appearance of age. I'll have three points on this. Kepler's supernova was a type 1a supernova that occurred in 1604. The star that exploded was just under 20,000 light years away. So if God created the universe with all the light from distant stars on the way, that means he also created it with the light from an explosion that never happened. You know what it's called when you arrange everything to look like something that didn't happen did happen? That's called lying. This makes God a liar. Further, this idea is logically identical to last Thursdayism. Let's argue that the omnipotent God of the universe created the universe last Thursday, and every appearance of age, including all your memories, your age, all the evidence of past civilizations, etc., is just part of that appearance of age. How would that world be distinguishable from the one that actually had that apparent history? It wouldn't be. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about the real age of the Earth in this scenario. Finally, this inserts into your epistemological framework an omnipotent, omniscient deceiver, meaning that literally anything could be God tricking you, and there's no way to ever know anything because no conclusion about the external world could ever be justified. I think that's more than enough to curb stomp this nonsense, 
And so we're skipping the rest of his silly appearance of age a bit. Isn't it interesting that around the world, civilizations suddenly sprang out of nowhere? No, because they didn't. There are archaeological pre-civilized antecedents to all the ancient civilizations. For example, the Egyptians that we know of from their own writing were preceded by the Marimde culture, the El Omari culture, and the Mahdi culture, and many others. The Chinese civilization is preceded by the Neolithic Heiligang and Hemudu cultures. The Sumerian civilization was preceded by cultures such as the Hala, Usana, Samara, and Ubai cultures. These Neolithic cultures are preceded by Mesolithic cultures, which are preceded by Paleolithic cultures. It is categorically untrue that civilizations simply pop up. They have continuity with the cultures before them, which were not civilized, by which I mean city building, which is the technical definition of a civilization. I do not mean that these cultures were dumb, brutish, or unsophisticated. They simply were not building cities, and they were not writing. You go back uh, 4,000 years, 5,000 years. And the Egyptians are into their civilized but pre-dynastic period. Cool. And you're seeing man has suddenly taken this leap, according to the anthropologist, from dragging his knuckles and stone tools to incredible sophistication and mathematical ability, where he's building these amazing monuments around the world. Not really. Gobekli Tepe is a stone structure complex from the pre-civilization era of 9,500 years ago. And it's a pretty darn impressive stone structure. The ability of humans to work in stone progresses, and the evidence of that progression is all over the archaeological record. You just have to look for it, rather than ignoring it because you want your flood account to be literally true. This is, of course, a great pyramid. I've been inside there. There on the right, you'll see that's called Nan Madal. They call it the Venice of the Pacific. It's an ancient civilization in Panape, which is thousands of miles from anything. They don't know how they move. Those stones are enormous. It is true that there is no consensus on how these stones were brought to Nan Madol, but they're not so big that simply rafting them is out of the question. It's more of a question of which of the techniques of several that we know were available were used, rather than not knowing any possible way to get the stones there. That being said, Nan Madol is really cool and more people should be aware of it. So after you're done watching my video for the day, I suggest you look it up. Also, calling it ancient in the same breath you're talking about the pyramids is a bit dishonest. Construction of the city didn't really start until about the 8th century CE at the earliest, or about 1200 years ago, whereas the pyramids were made in the 2500s BCE, or more than 4,500 years ago. You know, before the flood of Noah, according to most creationists. Some of them 50 tons. They don't know how the islanders move them. You ask the islanders, they don't know how it happened. They don't know, but they have folk tales. But also, what's the point of wondering this? Is some answer about how they got big rocks to some artificial islands in the 8th century really going to be evidence for or against the creation of the world 6,000 years ago? Or a global flood that didn't seem to bother the Egyptians? We're not getting more godlike. We started in the image of God. We're getting more monkey-like. Because he doesn't know how people move rock. Sure, I don't even feel the need to explain to you why people move big rock 1,200 years ago so people today monkey is a nonsense argument. It's called entropy. I'll just refer you to earlier in this series when I went into depth into what entropy is, and that will show you why this statement was dumb. Man used to live hundreds of years. There are no archaeological or biological data to support that claim. He was infinitely more sophisticated and intelligent. Funny, then, how humanity is at its highest point of technological development. And that's not a counter to the fact that it seems odd that humans now have better technology than ever before, despite apparently being morons compared to the ancient Egyptians. We've been losing it. Now, I know we've gone through a thing with, with the technology. We're, we're having a surge right now. But, uh, you know, man's age for the last several thousand years has been three score and ten. And uh, Oh, fun. Another random topic change. Now, go back to the Glacier Girl. Let me tell you this story. Back in 1942, a squadron of six P-38 Lockheed aircraft were on their way to Germany. They needed to resupply planes for a battle in Europe. They got lost in bad weather. They ran out fuel circling around because they lost radio contact. They finally decided the only thing to do was to ditch. They ditched in the snow in, in uh, Greenland uh, on a glacier somewhere. Here is where, near Kogay Bay. Sorry for the pronunciation. Not really close to civilization, but also on the high precipitation coast not the low precipitation interior of the Greenland ice sheet. They all survived. One plane flipped over. All of the pilots, the first one had his wheels down when he came down. as bad. He flipped over, but he was only minor injuries. The others left their wheels up. They slid in. They landed. They were eventually rescued. Weather cleared. They got radio contact. They came in. They rescued. And the war went on. The planes got covered with snow. Some aviation enthusiasts years later said, it was on record, they said, we think we know where they went down. Those planes would be so valuable now because they were brand new P-38s. Let's go dig them up and find them. They spent years and millions of dollars. These were some rich aviation guys finding the planes. They finally, using ground penetrating sonar, they found the planes 260 feet below the surface. Yup. And? Now, I'll tell you why this is important. Please, that would be lovely because so far it seems completely unimportant to the question of whether or not evolution is the best explanation for biodiversity on the age of the Earth. A lot of... Uh, 
evolutionists say we know how old the world is because we count the rings of ice. No, they don't. That's stupid. No one thinks that the Greenland ice sheet formed when the Earth did. We know it's older than 6,000 years because of the ice sheet, but we certainly didn't get to the 4.5 billion year estimate from frickin' ice cores. In the Arctic layers, and each one of those layers, those lines, represents a year. Yeah, they're taken from deep in the Greenland interior, where it rarely snows, and there is basically no warming effect from ocean currents to cause extra melts or more precipitation. You know, exactly where the Lost Squadron in general, and Glacier Girl in particular, were not found. Fun fact, Greenland is not the size of a parking lot. It has a varied climate over the whole island. They found these plains down 20,000 years. No, they didn't, because no one is using coastal glaciers for dating. In the ice. Yes, the coastal ice that is known to form relatively fast because of the higher precipitation rate at the coasts. And they later came to discover those lines did not represent years, they represented snowstorms. No, they did not, because Doug has no idea what he's talking about at best, or is lying at worst. I don't know if he's lying, because he doesn't really have the background that would make me think there's no way he could be this stupid. I think in this case, we're probably dealing with someone who's mostly incompetent. In one year, you could have dozens of snowstorms in that environment, and then it would thaw a little bit, and you'd get a little line in it, and it would get cold again, and it would get warm again, and it left lines. You can see it in one winter on top of your car. On the coast of Greenland, yes, but not the interior. And of course, we can also cross-check with things like pollen. Plants in Greenland don't all just give off pollen all the time at the same time. So you can cross-check the annual nature of ice layers with pollen trapped in them to see if they really are annual. And for the ice cores taken for dating purposes, it turns out that yes, they are. For the layers from the coast, no, they're not. It's almost like the people who spent their whole lives doing nothing but becoming experts at this actually thought about how to check if they're right or not. And some idiot named Doug who doesn't know what he's talking about didn't actually think of something that never occurred to anyone before. 260 feet down. They recovered the planes. They got one of them. They got all the pieces of enough to make one plane. This is the restored plane. They call it the Great Glacier Girl, and it still flies around to air shows today. There's a lot of fantasy that has gone into what is being taught in the world. I don't believe most conspiracies. Well, he believes in Yarrow creationism, which is one big conspiracy theory, so I'm pressing X to doubt on his lack of proclivity for conspiracy theories. Except one. I bet if we drilled down far enough, it would be more than that. There is a very real conspiracy among the academia of the world today to push a counterfeit view of origin on the world as the only solution. If it's a conspiracy, it's a conspiracy to follow the evidence without relying on preconceived ideas based on old books. If the old books turn out to be right, which they sometimes do, and that's cool. But if they turn out to be wrong, then oh well. No amount of Doug telling falsehoods is going to make all those Christians working in science suddenly actually be part of a vast satanic conspiracy to pretend that the world is as old as it is. National Geographic came out with a magazine that says, Was Darwin right? Before they give any evidence, you open to the page of the article and it says, oh, Was Darwin wrong? And the article says, No. Yeah, before they gave the evidence, they gave you the conclusion they'll come to. Then they gave the evidence. That's just structuring an article well. The article didn't just end there. Evolution is a fact. Yes, it is as much a fact as it's a fact that the sun is the center of the solar system or that germs can cause disease. They haven't even given any evidence. Yet. It's being taught as a fact, but when you really think about it, it's not logical, friends. That conclusion is not warranted by anything we've heard in this talk. I believe that there's some things we can't explain. No kidding, and just pretending that it means God did it doesn't actually make it so. Do we have a problem explaining things about God? A little bit. Where did God come from? I don't know. But you ask evolutionists, where did things come from? Well, world came from the sun when it exploded and it was sent to hurling our solar system out into space and... What? The earth came out of the sun when it exploded? The f*** is this guy smoking and where can I get it? That is completely bonkers and is not something I've ever heard other creationists propose. Have we found a man stupider than Kent Hovind and Matt Powell? Do we need to recalibrate the Hovind scale of stupidity? Where'd our sun come from? Well, it came from a supernova out there in the universe when a star exploded. Where'd that star come from? Well, it came from gas particles that collided. Where'd that come from? Well, we... And eventually, you know what they're going to say? Stop acting like a four-year-old who just learned that you can always ask why, because eventually we're going to hit the edge of our knowledge about the past. But that doesn't mean that what we actually do know about it is just false. Just like if you see a car in the ditch and ice on the side of the road, you can probably know how the car entered the ditch, even if you don't know where the car was manufactured. And just like you can know how to bake a cake without knowing what chicken laid the eggs you're using. There's a mystery. We don't know where something came from. Now they say the Big Bang, get this, 
Say the Big Bang was all the matter in the universe was somehow compressed to something the size of the head of a pin. No, it was just energy, and it was probably a lot smaller than that. How many of you heard that one? It exploded. No, space expanded rapidly, and an explosion is an expansion of matter within space. These are very different, even if they both involve expansion. Where did the pin head of material come from? Energy. But, I don't know, maybe it was always there. Maybe it was some kind of quantum fluctuation. Maybe the inflaton field is real. And that's where. Maybe God put it there. Not knowing that doesn't negate the knowledge of later history of the universe that science has accumulated. Either way, you're going to come to one of two choices. You can believe all the beauty and all the organization and all the wonders and all the inner working design and all the symmetry and all the math and the healing and the symbiotic relationships in the world around us today all came from a pinhead that exploded. Or there is an intelligent God, and we don't know where he came from, because he is from everlasting to everlasting. You can believe in both. Most theists do. And that means if there is a God, and he did make things the way he says in the Bible... Well, if there's a God, he definitely didn't make things the way Doug thinks. Well, the rest of this is just a bit of preaching. Well, if you enjoyed this video, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Benthovend, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Phil Kavala, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, Monkey They Them, Mrs. Spexender, San, Sphincter of Doom, and the Venerable Bead. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps, even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel, or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to it exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters. And either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.